our dates changed. And let me get those. So I can see. Our dates changed due to um, Veterans Day. Uh, I know we, we, we had a holiday, so that's not the norm. But you know, when we have a meeting that lands on a, a national holiday, we just modify a few things. So thank you all who are, are attending today because the modification also affected other folks who were not able to attend. So we're gonna move right along. I want everyone to use a moment to review the agenda that you should have received. And um, if there's anyone in the audience that would like to do any public uh, comment, this is an opportunity to raise your hand. Is everyone fine with the agenda? Can I get a raise of hands for we're okay with the agenda? Great, we'll move on. Jeremy, do we have any uh, guests for uh, public comment? I'm not seeing any guests for uh, for public comment. Uh, Commissioner James Garcia has sent me a message and has let me know that he's going to be a few minutes behind, but he'll be here okay. shortly. So um, no, we are able to move on. All right, we'll move on. Okay, so I'm gonna go right to the agenda. Our previous meeting recap. At our last meeting, and you know, I always like to start by going back so we kind of know where we're at at our last meeting. We had a intro uh, to policy. Sergeant um, Julie Smith spoke with us um, last meeting. We had a, we went over civil disturbance policy 317. We went over social media policy 220. And we also went over gender inclusive language with a presentation by uh, Commissioner um, Winbrock. And um, that's kind of where we were at as far as on our last meeting. I'm going to now go on to um, liaison reports. And I will begin with Councillor Zelenka. I don't have too much to report. Um, yesterday at our city council meeting, we did uh, two significant sustainability things. One was, one was uh, start the process to do a home energy scoring for when you sell your house about its, its um, energy score, kind of like the labels you get on your appliances. Mm -hmm. And then the other thing we did was we began the process to look at um, uh, banning new infrastructure for new hookups for natural gas and looking at a long-term transition away from fossil fuels. So um, those were two kind of significant things that we did at the council. Okay. Thank you for your report. Uh, uh, Councilor uh, Ye will not be um, here today. She has an authorized um, absence. Uh, I would like to now I'm going to, with Dr. Haynes Garcia, not in, right, I believe he's in, not in right now. I'm going to go in. We have a new human rights um, member representing our commission, uh, Ibrahim Kolobali. Uh, Ibrahim, during this time when I have like li liaison reports, is an opportunity where you would share with us um, kind of what's going on, keep us up to speed as far as what's happening with the Human Rights Commission. And this is your first time. So right off the bat, I want to welcome you to our commission. Thank you for, for taking up the task of doing this. And if you want to spend a moment kind of, kind of letting people know, I don't know if everyone has met you before, but maybe use a few moments to kind of tell us a little bit about you, a little bit about what you have going on with the Human Rights Commission. Yeah, th oh, thank you, Dallas. Um, a lot of familiar faces. Uh, it's my first meeting. Thank you for welcoming me. My name is Ibrahim Kulibali. I'm originally from Burkina Faso. Burkina Faso is a French spoken country, kind of small country in West Africa. And um, I, I, I grew up in, in France where my parents moved when I was seven. And um, I live in Eugene for a decade now, seems like yesterday and uh, call this place home. I, I, 
My day job, I am a senior civil rights investigator with the Bureau of Labor and Industries, BOLI. And uh, I, I am involved with the Human Rights Commission. And until last June, I was the president of the NWCP here uh, in Eugene. And uh, I'm also uh, involved with my union, SCIU 503. And I'm um, in region, California, Washington, and um, Oregon. I thank you for having me. Uh, as far as what's going on with the Human Rights Commission, we are working on the International Human Rights Day, which is December 10. And um, for those of you who have followed our work before, we used to um, award the International Human uh, Commission award on MLK Day during the NWCP March. This year, we have decided to move it to December 10 for, for us to kind of uh, put some spotlight on, the, on, on that day, the International Human Rights Day as a uh, human rights um, um, entity. Um, we would like to uh, give to that day more of a, a, a um, content as of what we do, but also how we spread words around around uh, human rights. So that's the main activity uh, we we are um, having right now. Our last meeting, we had the opportunity to have Ryan Dwyer from the FBI to come uh, talk about the activity uh, here in Eugene. Uh, also to um, um, present some of the program um, that the FBI has that folks may be uh, interested in on, on learning more about. And um, I have to say though that tonight uh, I made it here, but I will not stay long for one reason. Today is my birthday. And oh, happy I, birthday. <laughs> thank you. And I invited friends and families over. So they are in the living room. I don't want to be rude. And, and I, I, I thought that, you know, we were having the meeting last week. So since it has been postponed, but I have friends who came down from uh, Washington. So I, I, I just wanted to stop by and uh, introduce myself. I will watch the recording and, um, uh, I, I'm looking forward to working with each and all of you. Um, you Jeremy has my um, contact and I, I give permission for him to share uh, my emails and cell phone number with uh, all of the uh, commissioners here. Great, and I'll be giving you a call and I'll, I'll get you more to speed, but again, welcome um, to the commission. Really appreciate your service. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Um, I'm your dog. What's the name of the dog over your shoulder? Oh, this, <laughs> this is, I don't know. You know, it's this painting from a friend of mine. Um, the funny story is I am not a pet person because when I was a kid, I used to have a dog. And when that dog died, I couldn't emotionally uh, 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 go back to owning another animal. So um, my friend kept telling me that I don't like animal. I do, but I just think I'm not, I'm not a good um, uh, pet parent because um, I'm single and live by myself. I'm pretty much never home. I don't think I should have uh, um, in, uh, another being in my house while my own presence will be missed. <laughs> so that's, that's why I kept the painting in my office and I, I like it. I think she, she did a good job too. All right. Thanks for sharing. Thanks for sharing. Okay. Moving on to uh, our next liaison report um, representing um, the CRB, uh, Dr. Haynes Garcia. Welcome. Oh my gosh. I just got back and I'm, I'm eating. <laughs> um, uh, let's see. Um, I think I don't have an official report. I think that um, the CRB continues to exist. Um, we are continuing to, re to review files. We had a, um, a very interesting discussion uh, our last meeting last week 
uh, where we considered a um, an incident that related to um, actually we re reviewed a couple of incidents recently that um, involved uh, joint responses by uh, EPD and um, Eugene Springfield Fire, and we've been sort of looking at some some um, some cases that have have a some incidents incidents that have arisen in relation to um, sort of uh, joint responses and. So that's been been part of our discussion lately as in terms of it relates to policy. Um, <clears throat> yeah, uh, we I think are not meeting in December. We just decided not to have a December meeting. Um, uh, I don't know. I think that's pretty much all I have. Well, thank you. No problem. As long as we're up to speed, we appreciate whatever you bring to the table. <laughs> and I'm, I'm apologize for being late. I was running late with a previous meeting, and I haven't had a chance to eat yet. So I'm going to be eating on camera, and I'll try and do it. No screen. problem. No problem. Okay, we're going to go on to um, commissioner comments, and I will begin with uh, Commissioner Wynn. Excuse me, Jeremy. Thank you, Dallas. I've had several of the commissioners contact me about um, the feedback that is uh, or interference that is occurring and others are hearing. So I just wanted to send out a reminder. Uh, it, for the most part, I'm seeing everybody's microphones are off, but if you could please turn off your microphones when you're not speaking, um, we'll see if we can tackle it that way. I'm not sure where the uh, technical difficulty is originating from, but hopefully we'll we'll track it down. So thank you. Sounds great. Okay, Commissioner Wynn. Hello, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, it's good to see everyone. Aside from that, I want to extend a warm welcome to Ibrahim. Uh, I met him at, the, um, at a city academy a few years ago. Um, I'm very impressed with his uh, credential and passion in fighting for human rights. Uh, so welcome and good to see you. Thank you. Commissioner Shippers. Yes, um, so I'm sure many of you have seen some of the uh, fervor over uh, the recent arrests and recovery um, um, of bicycles made over on Chambers. I wanna thank the uh, auditor and the CRB uh, going into that knowing that um, there's probably gonna be some complaints uh, generated by what was going on going on over there. Um, so I want to thank the auditor and uh, the CRB for that, and as well as the officers for going in and, uh, you know, protecting our small businesses. Thank you. Commissioner Dominguez. Um, welcome, Ibrahim. I'm looking forward to emailing you later. And um, also, just as a side note, I believe I was the one that had said that I wanted to talk about pepperball policy. And I thought it was going to be at the end of this cycle of um of like the work cycle. So I'm working on researching this topic and the idea that I had proposed a while back. So I'm still not ready for this. And um I, I guess I wonder what we're gonna talk about. Um so anyway, that's all. Thanks. Commissioner Robertson. I believe she sent a message saying she could not uh, give comment at this time, but that she is listening. That is correct. Okay. And Commissioner uh, Davis will be coming, will be joining us after a while. So what I'm gonna be doing is going right into our next um, subject matter. Um, we're gonna be, we're after that, we have guests. We have guests here, and um, we're gonna be talking about our hiring and recruitment team. We're gonna have an update and an introduction, and I'm gonna turn the keys over to Sergeant Maloney. Is Sergeant Maloney on? Yeah, sorry, I had to find my unmute button. I was struggling there for a second. Um, so, uh, thank you guys for the opportunity to come speak with you and, and kind of give you an update on what's going on. Um, I know many of you probably have questions as to what we're doing and uh, how, the, how things are going. So I can kind of give, I'm going to introduce my team. Um, it's a new team. 
that we up until recently we haven't had really the the budget or uh, staffing and even the staffing is a, is still an issue right now but to to boost up um, an actual recruitment team uh, that's can be designated to work certain areas certain media certain things like that and so recently I was approved to get uh, eight more so up until then it was basically four of us so it was me uh, Kara Williams who I think most of you have met at some point She's the, the lead recruitment officer out of my office here in finance administration. Um, <clears throat> and then the two that were previously on the team were Jen Peckles, Jennifer Peckles and uh, Joe Fritz. So since then we've, we've added more. So we have a total of nine, um, which is really, really helpful. There's, there's a lot to do and a lot of outreach that we've uh, failed to grasp just because we haven't had the, the staff or the time to do it. Um, so I'll introduce my staff and kind of uh, just give you a brief introduction as to who they are. Uh, Jen Peckles, as I named before, she's been on the team, uh, I believe, since 2012, uh, trying to work different um, events and uh, as much as she can when she's trying to get off patrol. She's currently assigned to downtown patrol. She's been working there for a while. Um, her main task, uh, along with the next personal intro, is uh, all of our radio ads, radio outreach, and uh, working with video and trying to get the our videos updated and uh, attached to our social media stuff. Uh, the other person that's working with her directly on those things is Ty Meyer. Uh, Ty's a lateral from uh, the coast, uh, Oregon. He came here a few few years back. Um, he works, currently works motors. Uh, so he's on our TEU team. Uh, next is David Potter. Uh, he's with us as well. He's, uh, he's a veteran, comes to us and uh, he um, he's primary focus for the recruitment team is our military outreach and uh, knowing how the inner workings work with the military and how we can uh, help assist our veterans as they come out, roll out, and, and be looking for jobs and career fields relative to, to their experiences in the military. Uh, next is Glenn Gilhuber. He's unable to join us. He's been working, I think, 20 plus hours on a homicide and a couple other things. He just finished up about an hour ago and he just asked if he could go home and get some rest. And, and, and so I apologize for him not being here, but I think it's probably better for him mentally and physically to go home and get some rest. Uh, but uh, Glenn is, along with Kara, Kara's, a, this is her specialty as well, but he's you, working with the U of O um, athletic department and uh, the U of O departments um, for student outreach as well to, to work on recruitment through there and to make sure that we're reaching out to the, the diverse community that is U of O and it, it is part of our community. Um, uh, Detective Rick Lowe, uh, he's He's on with us as well. I think, I don't know if he'll come on or not just because of the nature of his work. Um, oh, there he is. Never mind, he came on. Um, he's a detective in our, our SIU. Uh, he's been here for years. Uh, he is currently working on the website updates. So our website was vastly uh, outdated uh, to the point where we actually learned that um, the, the old, um, basically website, epdjobs.com that we had wasn't even functioning and it was never actually purchased. So we, we had to work through that. And so we've changed the, the website domain and uh, updated the website and they're continuing to update it more. So we have it connected directly to our job links and uh, we get QRLs and, and we can get people access to it easier. Uh, Eugene Henderson, he's also here. He's working with Rick on the website updates. It's a pretty daunting task. There's a lot to it. So uh, then we have Caleb Goldsby. Uh, he's a lateral from Alabama. Uh, he's been with us for a few years now. Uh, he's assigned to our social media and signs and pop-ups for like, uh, when we do events and we go out to recruit affairs and that kind of thing. Um, and also Officer Joe Fritz, who's on our downtown patrol and one of our drone team guys. Uh, he's also working with Goldsby on the social media and the signs and pop-ups and that kind of thing. Um, that's kind of the intro of our team. We try to make it as well-rounded team as we could uh, through every areas of our department so that uh, including laterals, military, uh, male, female, everybody uh, that we could uh, focus on outreach to every, every community. Um, having this team is amazing. Uh, one of the things we run into is obviously shooting the video that we're working on right now. Um, Rick Stewart is a, um, he owns a company, he shoots videos and that kind of thing. So we contracted through him for professional uh, guidance in that as far as advertisement and uh, 
advertising that using proper videos and getting the, the layouts, getting overlays with the chief's voice and the chief's message as well included on those. Uh, that stuff gets expensive. So um, we're kind of, we're working slowly through that just to make sure that we don't overspend because um, uh, we don't have any budget approved at this point for anything more than what we've been doing in the past. Uh, but we're working toward that and hoping to get that. That would help immensely. Um, the video and social media stuff all overlays. Um, we also have, I'll just kind of go into what our recruitment efforts are. If anybody has questions, stop me at any point here. I know you're running short on time. Yeah. Uh, uh, you mentioned your budget. I was wondering how big that was. Um, it, as of right now, our budget is um, where I can find money in the in the city budget as far as uh so we never we never really were assigned a recruitment budget so i've never really had a budget if i've had something i needed to purchase or something i'd like to purchase or an event i'd like to get our people to um, i had to go through the process of um, asking for money from other areas of our budget to see if i can make that happen All right uh, i guess that takes care of my follow-up question which is uh, if there's a lives in the city limits stipend or subsidy to help um, draw in those lateral officers? Um, well, we do have a, are you talking about like a lateral officer incentive? Yeah, well, I know we've got the signing bonus, but I was wondering about specifically, because we talk a lot about community policing and being right. part of the community you live in, and then we don't provide any incentive to actually live in Eugene. Oh, um, we haven't really specifically targeted that really we so yeah, to be honest with you and that's something that here i'm going to write that down actually i want to make sure that gets discussed we do have a team meeting here coming up in the next it's, week or two it's something that i uh, am very passionate about that's a great idea Uh, Sergeant Maloney, you are currently muted, and I believe B and, uh, or sorry, uh, Commissioner Wen and Kulabali have a question. Got it. Sorry, I think I'm unmuted now. I'm not sure what happened. Um, I, okay, I was muted, so I believe I'm unmuted. Okay. So, Commissioner Kulabali, did you have a question? Yes, uh, 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 thank you, Sergeant uh, Maloney, for the effort uh, you're doing to get uh, the city some good officers. Uh, I, I, it's, it's just an offer. Uh, we will have a, an event um, um, linked to the human right, International Human Rights Day, where we may have the FBI recruiting team to uh, be on the Zoom and on live Facebook and talk about the recruiting um, um, effort. If you would like to be part of it, uh, please shoot me an email uh, for you to have the opportunity to, to, to address the audience and talk about uh, what you have available and what you're looking for in the community. That would be great. Thank you. I'll send you an email. Okay. Commissioner Wynn. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Sergeant Maloney, I have some questions uh, regarding your target in, in um, recruitment. Um, based on you know, what current uh, diversity stats are on our, on our force and uh, what, are, what are the department's strategy in you know, further diversifying as personnel? So I don't have the specific numbers in front of me, so I don't want to guess at those. Um, as far as our strategies, uh, I'm trying to find the most nationally well-known outlets for um, different diverse communities, whether that be uh, the National Minority Report, uh, whether that be Women in Police, whether it be LATPRO, whether it be, um, the, I think there's a, the National Asian Peace Officer Association. And then trying to find sublinks within those in order to direct um, target focus in those areas. Uh, and part of our stage one with this radio broadcast stuff is to um, is to hit obviously the state of Oregon, and then start looking regionally uh, for increased diversity areas, high profile areas for certain diversities, and then really pushing uh, out our ad campaigns in there um, to promote you know, the welcoming culture that we have here with with all cultures. Thank you. Commissioner Shivers. 
Yeah, uh, on that same subject, um, uh, I have four questions, which I don't expect you to be able to answer now. But as we continue to talk about diversity, I will bring them up again and again. The first one is, you know, demographics of our community and the demographics you're advertising to. Um, the demographics of actual applications we get, because if we're not getting enough uh, a parity of applications that, uh, that um, represents the people we're advertising to, um, that can indicate where the problem might lie. Same with uh, uh, demographics of graduates. So if there's a, a mismatch between applicants and graduates, we know we can sort of narrow down the problem in this way. And the final one is uh, demographics of officers and officers who have been here for longer than a year, because retention is going to be another topic we have to talk about a lot. Yeah. Um, so in short, we've we've recently started utilizing NeoGov. Um, I've only been in this position for about two and a half years. Uh, and so we've tried different methods of maintaining that all the way down to short surveys is trying to figure out what those demographics are and what we're looking at for demographics. Um, now that we've been utilizing consistent, consistently the NeoGov program, we can actually run um, software checks for data and analysis for specific demographics so that we know what we're looking at and what we're getting and where we're missing the mark and where we need to try and transition things and, and move those focuses to. Yeah. So having this team set up is really that's one of the, the main goals. Um, uh, as yeah. a follow up, one of the ways that um, Eugene 4 j uh, sought to solve uh, some of their retention problems was having a resource, um, like a funded resource and mentorship program, uh, which they had to do away with in budget cuts. And we can see the negative effects of that going down the line. So I would also love to see a, I, and I wish Naivasha was here, but like a mentorship program to increase retention of um, officers who are traditionally marginalized. Right, I completely agree. We used to actually have a mentorship back when we had our own academy. Um, so you would come in when, when you got hired, you'd come in and I'll use myself as the example. Um, the first week that I got here for our basic academy, um, throughout the whole process and my background and everything they learned about me and then talking to me, uh, they were able to pair me up with somebody of kind of like interest and uh, um, that kind of thing to where they would be my direct mentor. So as I go through this hiring process, and uh, work through the struggles of becoming a new police officer uh, and those stressors. I had somebody that I could go talk to that wasn't relative to my FTOs or my grading or really anything other than just kind of help me figure out ways to, to handle problems like, like they did. So um, that's something that Kara and I have talked about extensively as to how we're gonna re-implement that. Uh, you brought up Navasha and Navasha has been in on that conversation quite a bit as well. Um, and so we're trying to figure out the best way to do that and how we how we assign that out and how we make that uh, um, work for everyone, because um, that'll lead into the, the retention issue that all agencies are having. But um, that's one of our biggest things. Right. So health and mental health and fitness for people within the department and making sure that the people that work here and not only feel supported, but they still feel as part of the family, um, you know, obviously family members, no matter how close you are, have disagreements on, on times. But. Um, we want this to be um, a welcoming family environment for everybody. And so retention is big, and that's a big source of what we're moving our focus toward on this recruitment team. So it, you could lead, theoretically, you could call us a recruitment and retention team um, because that is one of our primary focuses because we don't want to lose good officers um, to a highly competitive lateral market um, just because we didn't give them a voice or they didn't have a voice uh, within the department or feel comfortable here. Okay, I'm going to go to Commissioner Kulabali. Yeah, it's just a lead. Uh, um, um, there is an organization called the National Organization of Black Law Enforcement Executive, Noble. Um, and one of the goal is to um, um, help diversify police agencies that, you know, reach out to them and they will promote uh, or they will, um, um, uh, how, how you say that, they will broad, broadcast your, your openings and, and your job posting to the, 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 the black officers that they have in the different 
uh, uh, police agencies to kind of um, um, encourage that type of lateral for black officers to move around and be in the areas where the police department are not very diversified. So uh, I think it's um, it's good to take a shot at, at that organization. And um, I, I have the contact somewhere, but because I didn't know we were going to talk about this, I, I uh, but I'll be happy to, to um, try to find the contact for you if need be. Thank I appreciate you. that. I would be more than happy to, to take the contact because any more contacts than we already have is only good for us. Uh, so we can, if we're not getting a response one way, we can go to response the other way. Um, just to update you as far as that, that is one of the main organizations that we have been recruiting for with through for the last uh, couple of years. Uh, so um, I just, I would love that. When I send you that email, uh, Ibram, if you could send me that contact back, that would be helpful because then I can reach out that way as well, just to make sure that I'm not missing something. Jeremy, your hand, your hand was up. Thank you, Dallas. I just wanted to offer myself as a conduit for uh, any of the contacts. If you guys want to send them to me, I'm happy to to send those on to Sergeant Maloney. If, if that is helpful, I'm happy to, to do that. So, Thank you. Okay. I'll, I'm going to take the floor real quick because when, you know, when we talk about recruitment and hiring and so forth, and you know, you, you, we bring in diversity and inclusion. And I hear, I hear all the conversations. <clears throat> so right off the bat, how short are you police officers, period? Just how many police officers are we trying to get? That's the challenge, right? So right now, currently, we're 18 short. We have three retirements on the, um, on the horizon. So we're going to be right around 2021 20, within the next two months. Um, to give you guys kind of a rundown, what we're seeing is, so when I first got into this position, we would close, we'd open our process in about four, we'd open it for five weeks. In about five days, we would have all of our seats full of 100 applicants plus 20 on the waiting list in case somebody canceled and we could get somebody in. And we would do that every three months. Um, since COVID and since the way, the way things are politically and everything surrounding police work, um, we open up, we've been open for five weeks. Our last two processes, we opened for five and a half weeks. Um, we have yet to crest 40 applicants. Um, we have a test this Saturday uh, on a process and we have 39 applicants. We had 39 applicants and I just got notified today that two were through. So those are the kind of the numbers we're looking at. And so our last process, we were able to, to get two laterals and one entry level lateral um, out of the 32 that originally applied. Okay, so that number we know. So that number we know is there's 18 or more you want to get. So have you been given any type of directive to say of the 18 that I'm looking for, I need to be going after so many people of color or so many people of different genders? I mean, so what, that's what I'm trying to find is if, if I'm hearing, which I hear often, that we're trying to increase minorities, we're trying to deal with diversity and inclusion, what is your directive? What, we, where do you go for that? Because if we're just using Oregon, that ain't going to do. The, this police force would never it would look no different than this look for years. So my question is, what, what is your plan to change? change and I, before I even say change any numbers, what number are we trying to look for? Well, I'm trying to get the largest number of diversity I can add to our community um, from outside of the state, um, in short. So what's hard about that is laterals makes it a little bit easier, but at the same time, nationally, we're competing with everybody in the nation, right? Uh, one, of the, the, one of my strategic plans, it has to do with basically the military and uh, reaching more out to the military based on the fact that the military is an extremely diverse uh, community of members from all over right. the United States, um, and not only um, military members, but their families and their relatives that aren't in the military that also then hear about us and that we can also outreach to. Um, that that streamlines how we can get ourselves across the nation, and then we can start looking at target areas when it comes to our ad campaigns, our videos, and reaching out to try and, and bring more diversity to our community from outside of our state as well. But I don't want to. Um, 
I don't want to not give the attention to the community members and the people within our state that that love our state and living here. Uh, but I do want to increase the, the likelihood that somebody's willing to move here and uh, bring something new to our department and community. Now, I'm just throwing it out here. I thought I overheard you say that one of the recruiters is from Alabama. Correct. Okay. Have we sent him back to Alabama to see what he could do as far as bringing minorities to Oregon? Yeah, that's exactly on the agenda. But right now, it's um, there's money involved. There's staffing and time issues, and it's trying to get him there. And he just joined the team three weeks ago. Commissioner uh, Dominguez. Thank you. Um, and then so following um, up with that, how is your outreach to the Latino community? Like, how are you doing that? Like, I noticed that at least by last name, I didn't hear anything that sounded particularly Spanish with your recruitment team. And maybe that's not necessary, but I guess I wonder what you're doing. And then like that video that you said that you're going to make, will it be translated? Um, will it have subtitles that are in Spanish or not that you would need that actually, actually that doesn't make any sense. Forget what I just said, because you would also need them to write, um, mostly speak in English. So that doesn't matter actually. Um, so forget that, but regardless, what, how is um, your outreach working out? So um, thank you for bringing that up. Uh, so mm -hmm. one of the things that is on our agenda right now that we've actually started and it should be launched by December 6th is not only with the, the ads that go out over English speaking radio and, and main radio, but we've reached out to Alex with, uh, like, I think it's, I don't want to mess it up, La E Kiss. Um, oh, he's, yeah. yeah, and so he's going to be interviewing one of our officers um, who wants to be on the recruitment team, but I don't have space for him. That's Jose Perez. Um, he is going to do that interview in Spanish uh, for his podcast, as well as um, some sound bites for, um, for Spanish radio and Latino radio, so that we can translate out that way as well and uh, be a voice for that community. What does that mean that he, there's no room for him on the team? I'm, I'm only approved for the people I have. So I only have, so I have to put out and there's contract issues with the process and seniority and how we, we work through putting somebody on an ad hoc team. So Jose is kind of, he's not a considered a, a member on the ad hoc team, but he volunteers and uh, helps out. It's kind of a career development where he's at until I have space on the team to, uh, to put him on that team as an ad hoc. Oh, so everybody else was, what? They all put in for it. They all put in for it. And Jose was still on probation and didn't fall under the guidelines of the, the hiring process for that ad hoc team. Thank you. Okay, does that satisfy your answer? Commissioner Dominguez? I don't know. I mean, it just seems like it would be pretty vital and important. And I feel like there should be some room made for somebody that has kind of their a little bit more connection to a particular demographic. And I think that it doesn't seem right to me necessarily that it wasn't thought of as vital. And now this person is spending their volunteer time on that. Not that I'm not a volunteer, but <clears throat> it just seems like it should be considered a little bit more important than what apparently, um, than, the, than it apparently it is. So anyway, um, I guess that's what's going on right now. I, and I don't know what to do about that, but. Yeah, actually, what could you what could be done about that? Well, to clarify, when I say volunteer, that just means he's not assigned to the ad hoc team. He's still being paid. He's still an employee. He still gets paid for all of his hours and times that he works. Oh, okay, so, thank goodness. Okay, yeah. great. No, no, no. Okay. <laughs> so <laughs> that's not what I meant. By volunteer, I meant just not assigned to the team specifically. Oh, so, okay. Well, that's different. Okay, thank you. Yeah, that's sorry about that. See, okay. all, questions, all questions are great. Thank you for clarifying. Um, Commissioner yes, thank you. You're great. Thank you. Commissioner Shivers? Uh, I just wanted to respond to what can be done about it. Um, that's one of the reasons I was asking about their budget. And uh, the first step, I think, is advocating for a permanent recruitment budget um, to be made within the department and uh, with city council. And Jeremy, can you, Jeremy, can you make sure that's, that we're taking down those notes on some of these ideas? Because the, the, because that's really what we need to be doing is coming up with different ideas to help them in their recruiting process is what I want to make sure that we are doing here. Commissioner Wynn? Yeah, Sergeant Maloney, um, <clears throat> as part of the process of bringing people on board or at least getting them enticed to want to come here uh, to Eugene, 
do you fly them out? Does the department, you know, pay for the candidate or at, even applicants uh, going back to the beginning process? Do you fly them out to Eugene to kind of show them around um, so they can see what they're, you know, what they might get uh, by moving here? Um, and, and is it just the applicant or the candidate, or is that including their, their family, their, their spouse and, uh, and, and kids? Because sometimes, you know, you have the dad or the mom wanting to go somewhere and work, you know, move out of their town. And the kids are like, no way, you know, I don't want to leave my school. I don't want to leave, you know, my friends. Um, yeah, so it, it you know, it's, it's a deal breaker sometimes. Um, does the department do that or do you know? Yeah, so one thing I definitely have learned is that if you don't include the spouse and the family in a lot of this, um, you're never going to to get buy-in from anybody because uh, they're either running away from their family or their spouse or else they're, uh, you're, you're not including them as part of the family like we do around here. Um, mm -hmm. So yes, I, that's, I thank you for that, that intro. I, I have a proposal on the table right now, but once again, it comes down to, unfortunately, it always comes down to money. Um, there's a proposal on the table right now and a complete plan in place to do exactly that. So the, the, the recruitment style of, I've already spoken to the Hyatt um, as well as the graduate at, at a reduced rate so that we can cover hotel nights for uh, a night or two. Um, and we get government rates on flights as well. So we could pay for the flight to come out, invite their spouse and family out, have a family weekend here. Um, I've talked to the athletic department at the U of O and also the arts and, and culture area of the U of O. And they're willing to donate tickets and things like that if we time up their, their trips out here to show them um, what the university is like, big events, what the community is like. Um, our recruitment team, there's plenty and just officers in the department have reached out and said, I'm more than willing to show somebody around, go out to dinner, um, tell them about the department, that kind of thing. Um, give them a full tour around the department, set up ride alongs uh, and make them feel welcome as well as just show them what we have to offer. And we're not, we're not going to make it sound like it's better than it is, but at the same time, we're gonna show them how great we think it is. Yeah, and I, and I would guess that in the summertime and, and you know, mid or late spring would be the best time for that, right? <laughs> right, um, yeah. Yeah, you don't want to fly somebody out in, in the middle of winter when it's, you know, cold and windy and full of rain. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Maybe if they're coming from Chicago or Minnesota and this is heat right, wave. Right. But or or Arizona, thing. places where it's really arid and they, they're, you know, they're missing the water. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Or if, I mean, last time I was in Missouri, I couldn't wait to get back in the middle of August to somewhere where I wasn't sweating, just standing there. So mm. things like that. Now, let's, let's talk a little bit about numbers. If I can just ask you one more question. Mm -hmm. um, what is our starting salary? You know, com are we competitive against places like Portland, uh, San Francisco, um, Seattle, or are we just, you know, kind of like a baseline of uh, what is the number? Because in San Francisco, I think their starting pay is $92,560. Uh, um, and, and with lateral officers, they might bump them up. Um, I'm pretty sure they do that. So what, what is the baseline here? And what is it for, you know, uh, lateral officer hiring? Um, it's relative when it comes to laterals because it's kind of, it's based on years of employment and years mm -hmm. of certification. So they'll come in at uh, one through six stages or steps is that they're called. Mm -hmm. um, a lateral officer with 20 years of em employment or certification can come in. They'd start, I believe, at step five with one step increase that'll happen after probationary period. Um, mm -hmm. And that will put them right around 40 to $41 an hour base around 84,000 a year, uh, which is um, right, I think a little above competitive for areas like big cities, like uh, San Francisco, mm -hmm. Los Angeles, things like that, where it's, it's very expensive to live um, right where you work and it's, it causes hours of commute, uh, which we don't, we don't have to deal with that here. We have, you can live in this community and afford to live in this community and be comfortable um, mm -hmm. and send your kids to, to whatever school you'd like, that kind of thing. We also offer uh, where it becomes a little gray is because certifications. So if you come with a certain amount of certifications or you're bilingual and one of the certified bilingual um, under our contract, it's an increased 5%. It's another increased 5% for shift differential. If you go to graveyard or if you go to swing shift, 
So depending on what you bring to the table, you could have an increased up to 25% of pay incentives um, to start out on your base salary, which would put a lateral officer, I'm just using this one, the lateral officer 20 years experience uh, with all the incentives would put them right around, I think I did the numbers a couple of days ago, right around $50 an hour. Uh, and so that would bump them up to 94, around 94,000 a year, almost, almost more than that. Now everyone Thank should you. have in the packet, we have a packet that was sent to everyone. And in the flyer that you're using, it says join our team, 65,832 to 83,948. Yes. You know, that's, that's what we're putting out there right, right now. Plus um, sign bonuses, plus moving and plus. Right. 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 Yeah. And so for the laterals, you, that's why we have that lateral incentive. Uh, so we cover moving costs. We cover different expenses. Uh, first, last month's rent, if they're finding a, an apartment for here that they need to set up uh, so they don't have to stress about that stuff. And we can make sure that's covered as well as we're uh, when it comes to laterals. I'll be honest, vacation time is big. Uh, vacation time is big and seniority is big. So when we bring in laterals with a recruit class, we start them a day earlier to give them a higher um, uh, seniority because that makes a difference two, three, four years down the line when they're um, bidding for shifts and you know have the, the family to think about. Um, and, and so, yeah, I had a thought, but then I just completely lost it because I went off on a tangent, sorry. Uh, we, have, we, we have a few more um, questions and we'll be moving on to another subject matter. So okay. what I'm gonna do is ask that each commissioner kind of do your brief next question and until we move on. So I'm gonna start off with uh, Commissioner um, Shivers. Yeah, uh, so at the beginning of this, Dallas, you, you sort of asked the big question, right? Which is what, where do we wanna go? What's the goal here? Um, right. And I think that's largely a conversation for us, right? As the police commission, we, we need to talk about, um, you know, what the community values and, and where we wanna go. Um, for me, I think a starting place is population parity um, with the, the city of Eugene. I also, just like the diversity we see on the police commission right now, don't think that goes un far enough to address historic inequity, right? Um, but yeah, I think that's part of the, the bigger conversation that this is an introduction to. And I would say, you know, not, not to mention just say thank you for having me on this, but when it comes down to it, I've, I'm hearing a lot of good ideas and really everybody has a certain area that they really want our team to focus on or a community that you're, uh, um, that you're working on increasing the, in our, within our department. So if you have any of those suggestions at all, I would say, I mean, I think Jeremy's probably the best conduit and he's volunteered that, but any ideas at all or any contacts or any outreach that you would suggest we look to, um, that will only help us and that will increase our opportunity to, to reach out, right? We need as much help from you guys as we can because um, we don't we don't know it all and we're trying to figure it out as we go. Okay, next I have um, Dr. Haynes Garcia. Yeah, so um, uh, thank you for presenting. I, I It sounds like you're doing a lot of really uh, wonderful, um, creative uh, problem solving with, with, with this issue and I appreciate the difficult national environment that you're recruiting in um, and the numbers you gave us for that. Uh, I was wondering, so I was looking at the qualifications for uh, Eugene Police and um, and uh, sort of then thinking also about um, uh, how you were describing um, reaching out to the military because it's a very diverse workforce you might recruit from. Um, and so I'm wondering, I was trying to think about other uh, similarly, um, similar pools that you might recruit from that would also be uh, more diverse than than um, than the typical police departments rosters, and also uh, would would have candidates that would likely meet many of the qualifications for for EPD. And so I was, I was thinking about social workers. Um, certainly, um, Portland State University has a has a uh, MSW program, as does Western Oregon. There are similar programs in in Washington State as well. And people who are who are coming out of those programs are disproportionately female, disproportionately people of color relative to the, to the general population. And so would, would be a, would be a, a wonderful um, uh, pool to recruit from, um, as well as, uh, uh, you know, a nursing has its own 
has its own shorted, personnel shortage right now. So, so that would that that's a an overly tapped market as well. But but you might think about um, uh, uh, people who are who are coming out of medical health um, training training programs as well, uh, maybe short of nursing. Thank you. Those are some great ideas. Yeah, those are great ideas. Thank you, um, Commissioner Dominguez. Oh, I just wanted to say that actually I take it back. I think it's still valuable to have um, Spanish subtitles, that being because um, it doesn't mean that you're not spreading the word. So if you have the Spanish subtitles, somebody like it could be um, an older adult could still tell like a younger adult, it's like, by the way, I saw the EPD is hiring right now and it was in Spanish. So like, you know, kind of will still invite that group of people. So actually I still think there's value there. Um, also, I was just curious, and I actually don't know if it's kosher, but um, quote, quote, um, uh, do you recruit from high schools? Um, I'm just curious, like, is that not allowed or, and I know that they're younger than, but just like in kind of in preparation for kind of like for the future supply of police officers, um, just wondering. Yeah, so to kind of answer that in short, we do, um, but we recruit it more for our cadet program. So our cadet program is actually pretty pretty good. Um, this last process, the last couple of process, we've hired three of our previous cadets that have gone through when they were in high school and then just graduated high school while going to, to college um, have worked through our cadet program. And so they've learned a lot about uh, you know, who we are, what it is as a department. And they've we've highly trained them to go basically anywhere they wanna go, but they choose to stay here, um, which is, yeah, nice to hear. It's super nice to hear. So we try not to um, go too much into like the student body of, of high school just because we're, they have to be 21 to even apply. So we're five, six, seven years away most of the time, but we do promote our cadet program uh, so that they can learn about it. And um, we used to use our school resource officers when they were in the schools to help promote that and to give outreach and the flyers for that and to, to be those contacts. We're trying to learn how to navigate that now. That's the best way to do that. There was recently a, a career fair at Sheldon that we uh, we sent our cadet post to. Commissioner Kulubali. Yeah, and I promise this is my last uh, uh, question for the night. Um, I am sorry about my daughter coming in and out. You know, being a single dad is not easy. Um, I think uh, Commissioner Dominguez touched a little bit on what I wanted to um, talk about is uh, probably if it's not already in place, try to uh, encourage you to contact UVO and LCC, uh, uh, the, the uh, criminal justice program to offer like uh, an internship to uh, the, the, the student who are getting ready to graduate if it's like 10 hours or five hours to um, get to know uh, the, the Eugene Police Department and may, maybe you may uh, suscitate some, some vocation over there. The, the, the second suggestion I wanted to make is in your video to feature uh, uh, Commissioner uh, Boggs and maybe the Commissioner Dominguez to as a non, um, um, I'd say, no, law enforcement uh, 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 people to be able to talk a little bit about or encourage people, um, you know, the, the, of color to uh, uh, join the Eugene, uh, Eugene uh, 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 Police <laughs> Department, um, you know, kind of invite them to say something or to encourage people um, uh, to join your, your department. So those are the suggestions I wanted to make. And I, and, I, and I would like to add to that, uh, we could have Commissioner Wynn as well. Um, you know, so no, great, 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 great idea. So we're going to move on to our next um, agenda item, which is um, our arrest policy 300. Hopefully everyone's had a chance to kind of look through. And we're going to have um, Sergeant Smith is going to kind of tell us about um, some of the changes. Sergeant Smith. 
I just want to thank the recruitment team for being on there tonight and, and giving the presentation. Um, thank you guys for sharing what you're doing and um, the hard work that you're doing. Yes. Okay, um, arrest policy. This policy was actually um, looked at and updated and revised in um, January and February of 2020. Um, the reason it's coming back up for revision and review is that um, uh, <clears throat> by priority, obviously, we, um, we're doing all the policies for gender inclusiveness, but um, Senate Bill 386 and 418, um, we wanted to add the verbiage to include um, that, um, which uh, each one has its own. Um, one of them deals with um, not um, interviewing um, offenders that are uh, minors. Um, one of the Senate bills covers that um, uh, we cannot entice a interrogation or a, um, uh, from them uh, by giving them false information. Um, and then uh, the other one is uh, that um, notification needs to be made to um, parent, parents for all uh, minor interviews that are conducted. Uh, we also um, wanted to include, do, uh, because of COVID and um, some of the medical issues that have coming up, uh, many of the outside surrounding agencies and other agencies are refusing to um, uh, extradite their offenders um, and service their warrants. And they're requesting that we um, provide a citation in lieu of custody for those warrants due to um, uh, offenders that have medical issues, COVID related or um, associated. And so we wanted to add um, that verbiage in there to um, for officers that are in the field to be able to issue those citations. Previously, that was uh, not allowed to be done based on policy. One of the um, things that's one of, on our 14 points in the bi biennial report, one of the questions, commissioners, that was on that from our discussions was how long can a person be detained prior to an arrest? That was a question that came out of our group. So we brought here to help kind of answer that, we have uh, Lieutenant San Miguel. Are you available for that answer to that question? Uh, yes. However, there is no clear cut answer to that. Um, totally understand, but let's, let's give it a shot. Well, if you're conducting an investigative stop, you have to have, first of all, reasonable suspicion to be, believe that a crime has been committed or it's about to be committed. And um, you can conduct the investigative stop as long as it um, as you need to to investigate the crime to either confirm or deny. You know, if the person chooses to walk away at that point or they choose not to talk with you, you have to determine whether you have enough probable cause to actually make the arrest, the physical arrest, and detain them for the rest of the investigation or not. And that's kind of the difference between reasonable suspicion to detain them and probable cause to arrest them. So there is really not a set time frame that someone can be detained. And it's, you know, probably unreasonable to put that specifically in the policy because every situation is going to be so different. I know. Okay, so we have some questions. So Commissioner Shepard? Yeah, so it sounds like um, until they try to walk away, it's sort of a Schro Schrodinger's detention. They're neither detained nor not detained, correct? Correct. Uh, generally, you would consider it a consensual contact until they say, hey, I don't want to talk to you or I've got places to be. I'm leaving. And then you say, no, you're not free to go. I'm conducting an investigation or I have reason to believe X, Y or Z. So it, it really ends up being consensual for as, usually as long as the officer can make it that way. And um, they, they're, the officers have to determine when they go from reasonable suspicion to probable cause. And every situation is going to be so different. Dr. Haynes Garcia. 
Yeah, I was. I'm sorry. I was, I was smiling because we just spent a long time talking about this issue in, in um, CRB recently, um, the consensual um, versus uh, detained. Uh, I actually have. So I was reading this, and um, I appreciate the effort in um, adding the language in to address uh, SB 386 and SB 318. I noticed that in the 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 version of the po of the policy that I've been given, um, there's a typo. Senate Bill 418 is 481. Um, <clears throat> and so I just want to point that out, as well as in the paragraph before that, um, so 300.2.2a, uh, there's the period inside of the parentheses instead of outside um, at the end of the sentence. I did spend, I, I do feel like the, the language in 300.2.2b. Um, um addressing senate bill 318's requirements i i, I just find it to be a little um un, i don't know the, the language is a little clunky and i so i looked back at the senate bill and i realized that it's even more clunky in the senate bill and so i can see that what you were doing was rewording the senate bill language to try and make it clearer and i i spent quite a bit of time trying to trying to to, to work on that and i gave up so um so i appreciate the effort that you have put into improving the Senate bill language to make it clear. Um, and I wish I could help you make it even more clear, but I can't. Okay. What about this clunky? Sorry? Commissioner Shivers? Oh, hand. sorry. Oh, I, I thought, oh, sorry. Oh, excuse me, are you, are you done? Yeah, please finish right? before. Yeah, please oh, finish. I, think I, I wasn't sure who asked the question, what was clunky? Oh, it was Bonnie. Oh, yeah, it's just, um, so I was having, I know that I, as a lay reader, had difficulty with, with the language um, uh, juvenile statement involuntary when an officer intentionally uses information known by the officer to be false, to elicit. There's a lot of, there's a lot of um, prepositions there. And so as a former composition teacher, right, if you have more than three or four or five prepositions in a row, it starts to become unclear what's modifying what. And so I was trying to reduce that, but um, I couldn't. So I think it's just in the nature of of, of what's being conveyed here. The, the only alternative I could think of would be to say this in like five separate sentences. On to me. That's a great, that's, that's a great point from um, a person who teaches this. So we're gonna go to Commissioner Scheibers. Yeah, so um, I have a few questions or um, more statements about 300.4.3 uh, uh, citations in lieu of custody on warrants and um, uh, uh, reasons that you might not want to do that. Um, I would like to add a, a restraining order violation to that list. Um, uh, you know, we just talked about domestic violence and how contentious and uh, how often um, that can escalate over time. If somebody's violating a restraining order, I'd like uh, at the very least to consider not cita citing them instead of serving uh, the, the warrant on that, um, uh, as well as harassment, uh, particularly against groups protected under hate crimes and, and biases. Um, I would like that to not be something that you can be cited in lieu of arresting. I want those folks to be taken off the streets so that they don't escalate. Um, I think I'd, um, in regards to um, the restraining order violations for mandatory arrest, um, I mean, th those are the mandatory arrest, we have to arrest on them. And so they would not be cited on those. Yeah, I just mean like including that in this list here uh, will decrease that uh, cross reading. Okay, thank you. I have a question um, on the, because uh, he, he just brought up domestic, domestic violence. In Eugene, when, a, when the police come out on a domestic violence uh, arrest, is the um, restraining order automatic or does that have to, or, or is it not? Can that person go to go be taken away and released without any type of restraining order in Eugene? Is that correct? 
Yes, but normally that's going to be a court process. Um, they're probably going to have a some type of a uh, bench release agreement that um, would restrict Correct. contact. Correct. So if something happened on a Thursday, it could literally be Monday with that person free to do more damage to a person because um, there was no restraining order. Based off, based off of that, depending on when they could get into court, correct? So what I'm, what I'm alluding to is, what do we have to do? What has to be done where similar to like, say Little Rock, Arkansas, if the police come out and get a person for a domestic violence, they automatically have a restraining order, automatic, no FNYs or buts. How do we go there? So I think what Sergeant Smith was alluding to is, when the person is lodged in jail and then they're released from the jail, they mm -hmm. are almost always issued a no contact order with the victim. So there generally is, it's not called a restraining order, it's a no contact order that's issued um, by the uh, jail, by the custody referee um, that prohibits them from contacting the victim until the court process happens and then by that time, the DA's office will have a victim advocate contact the, the victim and help them through the process of getting a restraining order if it's needed. But there almost always is a no contact order when someone is lodged at the jail on domestic violence. Because uh, we were hearing in a previous meeting that often when the police go back to another, uh, the second time, they're, they're often going back to the scene and I don't know if that, that, that is doing the job. Maybe that needs to be stronger. Maybe it needs to be a restraining order that's automatic. It's from what, we're here, from what we've heard at a, at a previous meeting. I'm gonna go ahead, that's, that's, there's, we're gonna be hitting that one hard soon on this domestic violence, because there's a lot in my opinion that needs to be changed when it comes to how we are handling the victim as well as the person who's doing the, the problem. Um, Commissioner Dominguez, you're next. I completely agree with you. And, um, uh, but sorry, this doesn't actually follow the same thought. Were you done? I'm done. Okay. Yeah, of course. <laughs> um, uh, I was just wondering for the section 300.2.2, where it says temporary custody of juveniles, um, how soon are they supposed to be notified, uh, the, the parents of the child? Because it doesn't really specify, just say it says parental notification required, but then it doesn't say. And it seems like maybe I think that that step would need to be taken. And I don't think that it's too hard to say like less than 24 hours or probably like immediately. I don't see why you wouldn't notify the parents immediately. Um, yeah, it is. It, it would be immediate, but I could consider putting the word immediate in there if that um, would help. I think I think it doesn't hurt to add that. Um, I can, I mean, I can imagine it not being taken care of immediately and just a lot of concern happening. So I just think, I, I don't think it harms anything. Thank, thank, thank you, Commissioner Dominguez. Commissioner Wynn? Yeah, I just have a, um, a couple of verbiage that I would like to suggest, you know, editing. Um, so right above the paragraph, right above uh, 300.4, uh, citations in lieu of, of custody. Right above it, you know, section B, it says, um, if the request involves a warrant of a less serious nature and there is no immediate need to dispatch an officer on it, um, I'm wondering if there's a way to phrase that without using on it uh, at the end. <laughs> Not Nothing, nothing big, but just, you know, just that. And then the other section is uh, page 11. I, I took, I apologize, I took screenshots of it on my phone, so I don't know which, uh, which uh, policy this is, but I think it's the same one as page 11. Um, section B, where it says the crime for which the suspect is um, under arrest is an A or B felony. Um, can we add in something like class A or B felony? Uh, 
just just the word class. Yes, I can add that in. Okay, thank you, Sergeant. And then what about the first one that I was talking about? Um, maybe I'm just reading it wrong, but... Um, if you just delete on it, it still works. Yeah. I will also look at that. I can, that's something easily could be done, yes. Okay, I appreciate it, thank you. Are there any more questions? What I'm gonna do, we have two commissioners who, who have joined us. I, I, I would like to give them an opportunity to do a um, opening um, comment if they would like. Um, I'll begin with um, Commissioner um, Mogart. Welcome. Uh, well, thank you. Uh, I just had work this evening. I generally have work on the third and fourth Thursdays of the month. So got off early and I'm able to join. Thank you. Did you have any, any comments that you'd like to share or are you fine? Uh, not at this time. Okay. And I'd also like to welcome Commissioner uh, Davis. Hello, everyone. I apologize for being late. Um, and it's good to see everyone. And I don't have any other comment at this time. Thank you. Thank you. All right. We're going to move ahead, unless there's any more questions. Excuse me, there are, there are a couple of questions. Um, Commissioner Wynn, did you have a, a follow-up question? Did you have no, I'm sorry, I didn't lower my hand, I apologize. No problem. Commissioner Dominguez, did you have a question? Uh, yes, I was just wondering, um, for the, sorry, for the Senate Bill 481, um, I was just wondering, what is the call to action exactly there? What's the question? What is the call to action? Like what, what exactly is it asking of an officer? And where are you reading that at? Oh, sorry, I'm so sorry, 300.2.2B. Where it says Miranda warrants? Um, no, although actually, I thanks for reminding me, I do have a comment on that. Um, no, uh, Temporary custody of juveniles still kind of on the same topic I was talking about before. I will I will turn that over to Sergeant Smith if you have any. Do you see where she's at on that, Sergeant Smith? I'm uh, I'm currently trying to scroll to that section. You would you mind reading oh, sorry, it, Bonnie? Page six. Uh, it's page six. Um, B. Uh, it's the one. Um, 2021 Senate Bill 481, which is actually 418, renders juvenile statements involuntary when an officer intentionally uses information known by the officer to be false to elicit the statement during custodial interview regarding all misdemeanor and felony investigations. And what's the question regarding that? You want some explanation of what that means? Yeah, I guess so. It's like, what exactly is the call to action here? Like, what are we asking an officer to do here? <clears throat> um. You know, there's case law um, surrounding this, but um, an officer while conducting an interview and interrogation um, can use, um, a, I guess, a, a false statement to, um, and I'm trying to, I'm trying to think of a good example, um, because it's not a technique that all officers use, but um, uh, and so this prohibits that from uh, from that technique using it at all um, when interviewing um, a child or a minor. Does that make sense? So, uh, sorry. So in summary, the what is the technique called? Lying. Lying. Yeah. yeah if I might. <laughs> so Bonnie, an example, a, a common example in in, in television dramas might be where a, a officer says you, your, your buddy already confessed when the buddy hasn't confessed yet. So it's a form of deceit in order to, to elicit a, um, you know, evidence from, a, from someone. So the way, the way you're going about getting evidence from a minor is different than an adult. An, an adult, you can use various tactics that you cannot use on a child. And that's why was this sense. particularly, um, why was this law created? Why, why, because it, I mean, it seems 
semi harmless in a way. And I guess I wonder why is it different from an adult and why is this one specifically being called out? And, um, and then why aren't we specifically saying lying? Just don't lie to the child, I guess. Because, because everybody was saying that this is such a, a convoluted way of saying it, I guess I was wondering what exactly is it that we're telling officers when they're reading through this? It's just like, what exactly is it that we're telling you not to do? And I guess maybe, um, I guess it's it, because of the way that it's the sentence is formed, it's almost like just saying, well, maybe just don't lie rather than saying it in such a convoluted way, don't lie. Um, perhaps. You're right, Bonnie. And uh, we were just trying to include the verbiage from the um, legislation. For historical purposes, uh, later on, I mean, um, it's helpful if the verbiage is similar to what the legislation um, was intending, intending to, um, so that, it, you know, in further um, revisions, it will lose the meaning of what, what the intent is, you know, we just try to keep the language as close as we can to the Senate bill. Okay. Um, I guess I'm hearing and, what people are saying though. And so we'll look at that paragraph to, to try to, to, to clean it up so that it's not so confusing. Okay. And okay, if there's time I want to make sure, I want to make sure we're on the exact same page. We cannot, re, re, we cannot in this body re, re, rewrite a Senate bill, correct? So there, there is a Senate bill that, that, that covers this. Then my suggestion would be use the verbiage of the Senate bill, period. Because that, that, that is written. We, 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 we're, we, can't revive, we cannot change the verbiage of the Senate bill. So if we're dipping into trying to change verbiage, and then we're discussing why that verbiage works or doesn't work, then I say let's revert back to what is, what is, what is passed through the Senate. Do you see where oh, I'm going? Okay. So are you saying that, I we guess, can. to clarify for myself then, oh, sorry. No, we, we, can, we, can, we can better explain, we can explain what it means, but we cannot change the verbiage. That's the point I'm, I'm trying to make. Oh, yes, we cannot change. No, 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 that'd be interesting and odd and cool, but weird and actually not cool. Um, <laughs> And, and, um, and to be totally honest with you right now, so my suggestion is this, and I've been around the block a long time. Right now, I don't feel that anyone right now is prepared to explain what you're needing. So, so what I would do is, Jeremy, if you and Sergeant Smith can help provide us a better answer for Commissioner Dominguez, because we don't have it right now. Yeah. So whatever, whatever, whatever we need to do to research and find an answer because it's a great question, but I'm just but the one thing I want to make sure that we're all on the same page is we can't we're not changing a Senate bill, all and, and if it's not written exactly as a Senate bill and we've rewritten in a way that does not make sense to this body, then we need to go back to what it is and then explain what the, what it means, versus trying to find the right verbiage. So, yeah. um, uh, Commissioner um, Shivers. Yeah, I think um, I think I might actually have the explanation. Um, and Bonnie, you can correct me if I'm wrong on this, but uh, it is since this is written as the police policy handbook, it's written with uh, the police as the audience in mind, and so reminding them that if they lie to juvenile suspects, it would render the testimony inadmissible in court is essentially the function of of what this is doing. Uh, I agree with everything that's it's a little bit complicated uh, and can be rewritten um, in, a, in a way that's a little bit clear, but I think that's the, um, that's the reason for the complication. Thank you. Okay, so I, I like the way we handled that. Commissioner Kulabali. Yes, I'm completely off topic. Um, um, you know, I was appointed as the, the, the liaison here and another person was appointed as my backup. Uh, Scott Lemons is uh, uh, actually in the uh, attendees. So I just wanted to mention that because he is uh, uh, following the discussions and, and the, when I'm not here, Scott will uh, be here to, to be the liaison for the Human Rights Commission. Thank you for letting us know. Okay, uh, Dr. Haynes Garcia. 
Yeah, I just really quickly wanted to 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 note that the this um, uh, Senate bill to respond to to Bonnie's questions, the Senate bill um, four eighteen was was introduced and and um, uh, advocated for on the the Senate and the House floor um, uh, by uh, youth advocate organizations that that wanted greater protections. And there's a long history of adding greater protections for for youth who are in custody than for adults. And so it was an attempt to, to expand protections um, for for young people um, who find themselves in, in police custody. And this is a, as a, as a minor clarification. What's, and one of the reasons for sticking with the, with the language of the Senate bill is that what's actually being, being um, done here is that state, the statements that are elicited as a result of deceit are, are being categorized as as coerced, as, as not voluntary, which is not necessarily the same thing as inadmissible, but it does change like what what, what their admissibility is. And, and that sort of gets into all kinds of legal things, which is a reason for keeping the language closer to the, the Senate bill. Oh, so it's like they're being tricked, I guess. And yes. they are younger, so they probably wouldn't know they're being tricked, I guess. Okay. Dallas, you are muted, sir. You are muted. Okay, we're going to be moving on to uh, bias crimes policy 304. We have um, Sergeant Benjay. Did I pronounce that correctly? Uh, very close to Sergeant Benji. Sergeant Benji is going to give us an overview on the bias. Crimes Policy 304. Yes. And I will leave it up to you. And thank you for um, joining us today. Absolutely. Uh, so this is another Senate bill. I think this Senate bill actually came out uh, earlier uh, than the, the more recent ones. Uh, our original policy was actually from uh, 1999. This is a policy that uh, uh, very much need to be looked at, especially dealing with bias crimes and everything going on in our, uh, our country currently. Uh, so I'm uh, very happy that uh, it uh, got pulled up and uh, and being worked on. Some of the big changes uh, that are happening in the policy, uh, and I believe you guys have had the opportunity to read through it. Um, uh, gender identity has been added, and then uh, with our uh, uh, our own uh, city code, uh, unhoused status is uh, added as protected classes. Um, so that's that's one of the big changes through it. The next, uh, and probably for me, the biggest uh, uh, change is the introduction of bias incidents versus bias crimes. Uh, bias crime being a, uh, there's probable cause to arrest somebody for a crime and uh, that crime was committed because of uh, a perceived uh, a bias. Uh, and uh, so that's, I, I think we're all familiar with that. The bias incident is a, uh, uh, something that didn't rise to the level of crime, but some kind of uh, uh, bias uh, language or intent or something like that was used. Uh, um, and now we are, uh, Senate bill asks us to track those uh, and report those uh, uh, up the state uh, for, uh, for counting. Um, and uh, I guess, uh, Anecdotally, uh, for that, it's uh, I think a little bit of the reason uh, we've uh, taken a little while to get uh, going on the policy here, and I think it still needs to be cleaned up a little bit, is it's difficult for police to, uh, we, we investigate crimes, we take reports on crimes. Uh, if there's a, a bias crime, that's a, that's a simple thing for us. Um, if it's not a crime, uh, then there's not necessarily a report. Uh, there's not necessarily a police response. Uh, if it didn't rise to the level of a, of a criminal act. Uh, so, and that's a, a little bit of what uh, our struggle of getting through uh, uh, what the Senate bill is asking of us. And I think we're getting there. Uh, so um, the way we, I think uh, the biggest way that we are gonna end up uh, reporting these uh, bias incidents uh, is through the use of, through working with the human rights neighborhood involvement. Uh, Fabio Andrade right over there right now uh, is the one I communicate with. 
if I become aware of a bias incident uh, and it doesn't rise to the level of a crime, it's something that we're not going to investigate, then I pass that information over to him. And then we're going to utilize uh, uh, their office to pull together those bias incidents uh, for, uh, for report. So that's kind of uh, real quick down and dirty in a nutshell what I see uh, the big changes are. Uh, Julie Smith uh, also is a, the main uh, worker on this. So Julie, do you have anything to add to that? No, Scott, you kind of hit the main points there. Thank you. Okay, I'm gonna go into some questions. Um, I'm gonna start with um, Dr. Haynes Garcia. Yeah, so thank you. It looks like um, uh, I imagine you're, you're, you're running into some challenges with your, your software for reporting things as well as um, the actual policy. Um, and so I'm wondering, uh, so, so I was interested in um, at, uh, what is this, 304.4B, um, so a bias, which you just, you just um, covered this, a bias incident does not include any incident in which probable cause of commission of a crime is established. And then the follow, the next, um, the next letter, oh, I guess that was A, this, this one's B, they're mislabeled on my, my copy. But so then for B, Bias incidents should be documented in a police report. The title of the report with the appropriate crime and select the bias crime category box in, located in the offenses module. And so I'm wondering, um, uh, right, we're not talking about crimes, um, but the report's being titled crime and we're selecting bias crime category box. Is that because there's no other way to, to navigate the, 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 the software, the, uh, um, incident report, um, our police report software, or um, is this just worded wrong? I, you hit it absolutely on the head. Um, I have that one highlighted in yellow. Uh, that's one that needs to, uh, we have to fix. Uh, right now, if we, if we do, so in a criminal case, uh, the bias crime category uh, is very essential for reporting and, uh, and tracking uh, what category was uh, targeted. Um, by, uh, if we were to mark that, that would immediately make that bias incident into a bias crime uh, for reporting. Uh, so that has to be fixed. Uh, you, you, you're dead on. Uh, so that, uh, not sure how we're going to fix that part. Uh, and so it, where bias incidents do come into our reports is often there may be an assault, there may be a crime that happened, um, and there, uh, the the person to be arrested didn't do anything uh, bias wise, but maybe somebody else at the bar fight yelled uh, a slur or something like that. So there was a, there was a bias incident involved as well. Uh, then that would go into a police report. And then that, uh, uh, in that report, I would share over to uh, Fabio uh, and, uh, and that's how we would track that. But uh, most of the time there's not gonna be in a bias incident, there's not gonna be a report uh, written by a, a police officer. So yes, that needs to be uh, uh, rooted out and fixed. Okay, um, great question and great um, finding that, uh, spotting that, um, Dr. Garcia. Commissioner Dominguez. Um, for a 304.4.2 report approval, um, under B, I was just wondering, um, the Special Investigations Unit Supervisor will normally send a copy of the report to the Human Rights Program Coordinator. I was just wondering why it says normally, and why maybe it could just be removed. Um, unless there's a reason for it to say normally? I can't think of one right now. Uh, I, I will uh, definitely mark that. And I'm just thinking on the spur of the moment, nothing's coming to mind, but uh, yeah, I, um, there, is a, <laughs> there, there is a little bit of, uh, the only thing that comes to mind is sometimes uh, uh, if a, if a, Investigations in progress. We don't necessarily share uh, the report yet, but uh, once it's been uh, closed out, uh, it becomes shareable. Um, so uh, I don't think there's any reason for the normally there. Okay. Um, and then, I'll strike the word normally from there. Okay, thank okay. you. Um, and then I was just wondering, um, this call out list, I'm not familiar with it. So this is under 304.4.1 victim assistance. Um, where it says, if after hours contact is needed, personnel can be reached via a call-out list or by contacting the HRN1 manager 
I'm wondering what the call out list is, how officers find the call out list. Um, can you describe that a little bit? Uh, hang on, I am catching up with you. Uh... Bonnie, while he's catching up with that, um, just to let you know that Fabio did review um, this policy and uh, Fabio Andretti and, and did rake, make the recommendation for that verbiage. So, um, um, but that is a good question. Like where, it, what is the call out list? So. Yes, and uh, uh, to agree with uh, Julie, I don't know about that call out list. So that's funny. I, uh, uh, that involves human rights neighborhood involvement, and uh, that's something that uh, directly uh, affects me in my office, and uh, it hasn't come up where I needed to call them uh, after hours or anything like that, but uh, there's definitely, if they have a call-out list that they want me to use, I should uh, I should know about that. Thank you for that question, and I want to make sure we do have follow-up on that one, um, Jeremy and Sergeant Smith, on this, on, on that question. Um, Commissioner Wynn? Hi, um, Sergeant uh, Vinjay. I was wondering how, when did hate crime uh, gets recoined as bias crime? It just seems like a watered down, uh, you know, severity of of, of uh, an uh, you know an act that that to me sounds more like a hate crime. Uh, when you say bias, when it's called bias crime, it just you know doesn't sound as severe. Um, you do you know the history of that or <laughs> I, I don't uh i actually in a couple of in services uh i want to i want to say three years ago we did an in service uh with the uh, human rights neighborhood involvement uh being there with us it, maybe it was closer to four years ago uh but uh that came up a little bit as well back then in the in the powerpoint that we were creating for our patrol officers uh in uh we were using uh, hate crime and bias crime uh, synonymously, uh, but as far as uh, it being uh, in policy and in the Senate bill and that kind of thing uh, as bias crime, I don't know what the reasoning or history of it is. Okay. Well, that brings is the department using the, I mean, the, the two terms interchangeably um, because they have, you know, the same, basically the same meaning Yes, uh, yes, would be the short answer. Okay. Okay, I appreciate it. Thank you. Quick question. Only, only because Dr. Haynes Garcia is part of this group. Does hate crime and bias crime the exact same meaning? So, so I don't know if for everybody it does. Uh, when I do uh, presentations to our police department and teach about uh, bias crimes and bias crimes reporting, I use them uh, the same, uh, and I don't know if that's perfectly correct. Uh, but in for for me and in our department, the way I the way I teach it, yes. Okay, now Dr. Garcia, ask you the exact same question. Is yeah, hate crime I, I, and bias crime the exact same meaning. I I I have never heard them uh, differentiated from each other. I I think that they they are typically, as I've heard them used, um, synonymous. I I I would say that. Bias crime is probably more of a of a legal um, uh, category. Probably comes more from 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 lawyers wanting to come up with less emotional um, language. Um, hate crime might imply a certain level of animus for for attorneys that and judges that that um, doesn't have to be present in order for something to be a a, a bias crime. That's, That's exactly just a guess, where though. it comes from. And then, and then in a good segue to that, I know you have a question, but I'm gonna still ask you the same question because you you have been in this role, um, Commissioner Kalabali. Is the is hate crime and bias crime the same thing to you? No, uh, no. Uh, a bias incident falls generally under the First Amendment. Like someone may call the N word, that's a bias incident. But when they call the N word while committing a, a crime, that's a hate crime. So the, the, the modifier from a crime to become a hate crime may be the bias incident. And, and usually the bias incident is not uh, um, prosecuted because it's not a crime, it's fall under First Amendment. Freedom of uh, speech. Uh, yeah. So my 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 question to Sergeant uh, Benji. I, I'm sorry if I 
I mispronounce your name, would be the, the, the EPD has um, liaison to certain communities. So do you inform the liaison when there is a bias incident? I've, I've given a, an example that will probably make it uh, uh, clear. Um, we, we, uh, I, I, I talked to a gentleman who was targeted because of being black and, uh, the, and, um, uh, in Eugene here. It didn't rise to the level of crime, but that was, uh, that was the, 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 the reason of him being targeted by this group was his uh, race as a black man in Eugene. So my, the, 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 my question is, do you inform that liaison to that community to probably approach the, the community leaders they're working with for support for that, for that person? Because sometimes it's important when um, 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 we, we have a, you know, Eugene is, has a, is a college town. We have the UVO. We have international students coming from different uh, part of the world. And if someone is targeted for being um, um, a Chinese or for being from Africa, it's probably great to have the police liaison to that to that community to be able to connect them with. Uh, uh, that person for 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 some sort of support. So that would be my question because uh, the bias incident, yes, it's it's kind of like you know, like we we'll say in the real world, it sucks, but it's not it's not a crime. But um, how can we get support to that person from the community that they may not be aware of? If a, a young boys or man or young person from China was uh, 19 or 20 or 21 years old, live here on campus and, and go to the university, get uh, uh, those sort of uh, uh, aggressive word. Uh, do you have a, a, a list of the community organization or community leaders or do your, your liaison to those communities can probably try to 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 make that 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 connection for support. Uh, that's a very uh, involves a lot of things. <laughs> Good question. Um, so first of all, when I give uh, training to the police department, uh, anytime one of the things that I train them is it's not a popular thing when police officers are called by somebody because they were victimized and. Uh, uh, and slurs were used or whatever and the police officer gets there and delivers the message uh i'm sorry that was so wrong but it wasn't a crime i'm not going to do anything and leaves uh that that's not a very that's not a good way to do business um so what i teach them is what we do have available to us is uh if you if you do have to deliver that message uh it wasn't a crime i can't make an arrest at least what you can do is tell them but what I want to do is uh, give you a number for human rights neighborhood involvement. Have you called them? Uh, they've got resources that they can uh, help you out with. And, uh, and so we're not just sending them away as if we don't care. We do care. We want to help uh, and, uh, and get them some help. I, as far as uh, the liaisons to the different community members having uh, contact persons, I love that idea. Uh, we don't have that quite yet. Um, we have been developing, uh, uh, some of the guys have been uh, working with different community members uh, and getting to know some of those leaders in those, uh, in those areas. And uh, um, I think we're getting there, uh, but uh, we're, we're not there yet. Uh, so, um, and if uh, uh, you have ideas, uh, uh, all of you guys uh, have ideas of good uh, outreach members, uh, Ibrahim, maybe even yourself, uh, uh, but uh, somebody that we can uh, uh, send people to. Uh, we, I would definitely pass those on to my guys, and uh, they would love that. Uh, anytime we can, in a situation that uh, the customer is not going to be happy with the, what we have to tell them, we can offer them something uh, uh, helpful. Uh, it's always a good thing for us. Great, great question. Commissioner Dominguez? 
Um, I just have a couple questions. Um, are political leanings a group that need to be under this or? Um... So that's, uh, that's a good, um, so there is, we, we track political leanings, um, but they don't fall under the biased crimes, uh, if that makes sense. Uh, so, so we will track uh, if someone was targeted due to their political belief, um, it'll go into our reports and we, we send, uh, oh, I think it's the state. I don't think federally they uh, take it, but uh, um, we, uh, we calculate those and send them up. Um, but as far as uh, uh, prosecution in district court, uh, it isn't gonna get, get them a bias crime in a, uh, for political belief. Interesting, okay. I was just wondering. I, I, I have one follow-up question. Yes. When you, when you said, um, are they targeted because of, what, what do you mean by that? Help me out when you say the political belief. You mean if they're oh, wearing so, a kind of hat? So if, uh, you know, a common one for us is uh, if they're anti-police uh, and we get targeted because we're police officers. Um, that's not a bias crime. Uh, another one that came up, has come up over the last couple of years is uh, uh Trump flag gets uh, torn down because uh, somebody's not a Trump fan. Uh, those kind of things. Uh, we're not, we, we track them, but we don't, uh, uh, there's categories in our report to put them down. But as far as prosecution and district court, uh, they don't fall under the bias crime one and bias crime two uh, laws. Why is that? Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I wish I knew. Uh, I don't know. Uh, it, uh, uh, that's what our ORS uh, is written as. Uh, right. I wasn't part of that. Uh, I don't know. Be free because speech. it doesn't have anything to do with the yes. person, color, religion, gender identity, sexual orientation, or origin. First Amendment right. Free speech. And it's very narrowly construed, Bonnie. Yeah, the so flag political. is Politico. Yeah, political. Okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go, I'm gonna, we're going to move on. Um, Commissioner Mogart, please. Thank you. Yeah, uh, so um, as somebody who's worked in the community doing bias and hate response, um, there is a big difference between a bias incident where there is somebody who's targeted because of their race or their gender or uh, any, of the, any of the different reasons people are targeted um, versus an actual crime that's committed. And um, thank you, Ibrahim, for uh, pointing that out. The other thing I would say is that there's going to be people in the community who say they speak for certain portions of the community, and then there'll be other people on that same, from that same community who say they will speak for the community. So you got to really be careful with that because there's a lot of different people that are siloed in their own little sections and their own little things, you know, and um, if you go to one of us, you got to go to all of us. And, and that's going to be a real delicate balance. Question, the caution. Question. I, appreciate it. Well, I have a quick question to, to what you just said, which I agree. I agree. Because when you're saying all these different, all the different groups, you know, who's the, who's the leader, but let's deal with like what, what they, what they can do now. I mean, what can they do now? So you're saying the, the Eugene police, it, did I hear you say you're giving the number to Andretti's office? Yes, uh, Fabio Andretti is the one that uh, I liaison with, and we have a, a relationship where I can always uh, refer people to him. Uh, one of the things I have to be careful of is I don't get a give because of uh, uh, people's right to privacy. I can't give Fabio their name and their phone number to contact them. I give them uh, Fabio's name number and uh, let them uh, reach out to him if they want to uh, want to do that. So we do have something now. Yes, I mean we we you, you, we can we can we can make it better. But I'm saying, but you you are doing something now. Yes, definitely. Yes, okay, commissioner. Um, there are portions of the community that do want to remain in the shadows. I mean, they don't feel like they're safe going to the police department or even going to the city and saying this happened to me or I'm being targeted or my business is being targeted or they increased my rent because of this. Uh, there's large portions of the population where people don't feel safe in that and that uh, in making that reporting uh, available. So you're, saying, so you're saying there's people that would not utilize 
Co correct. But if he's giving someone other than the latter part, we say they walk in, they, 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 they're in an incident, they can't help, and they just leave. He's saying that at least they're giving them something. So at least I think yeah. they're giving them something is better than nothing. Yeah, that's old practice. They've been doing that for several, okay. if not decades, years. Commission, Commissioner Wynn? Yeah, Sergeant Vinjay, um, I wanted to let you know about the Oregon Chinese Coalition. Um, that's one um, uh, organization you can, you know, send people to. Um, I... Uh, last spring, we worked with uh, Captain Meisel um, and her team in setting up a, um, a training, uh, actually a seminar on uh, personal safety. And uh, that coalition was able to um, invite about 100 people uh, to, the, to the training. Um, so I, you know, they have, they have a Chinese... Uh, uh, web page as well as English, um, and they're they're also connected with the Vietnamese community uh, organizers. Uh, they're connected to the Korean uh, Americans uh, coalitions as well. So that would be a good you know organization to uh, get in touch with. If you need um, an introduction, I'll be happy to make an introduction for you. Absolutely, yes. I got to speak just briefly at that, and I really appreciate it. There was a it was a great outreach. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Thank you. Yes, um, Commissioner Dominguez. Um, I just wanted to note that we started talking about bias crimes before our time was up for arrest policy, and I had some questions for arrest policy. So, um, yes. And then what I'm going to do is let you ask your questions on arrest policy. Oh, right now? Yeah. Oh, thanks. Um, I was just wondering, um, let me scroll to that area real quickly. Um, sorry, one second. I have to like scroll to that section because I was looking at the schedule. Oh, okay, there we go. Okay, so under um, 300.3 warrant arrests. And what page is that on? Oh, sorry. Thanks. That's better. Um, uh, page six. Um, 300.3. Uh, looks like A3. Mm -hmm. It says, except in cases of fresh pursuit, consent, or when exigent, I don't know how to pronounce that, exigent, circumstances mm -hmm. exist, a search warrant will be obtained prior to making entry into premises to serve an arrest warrant unless the subject of the warrant resides in those premises and there is probable cause to believe that the subject is there at that time. I was just wondering, um, so is that saying that you can go into a house if you suspect that the person lives there? And I guess I'm wondering, for a warrant, I guess I don't really know what a warrant warrants, like how much force is being warranted. And I'm wondering about the safety or how this might account for the safety of those that might be living in the house. So if a person is there um, and there's a warrant out for a particular person, like if they have a family or something, how does that, um, how does that come into play? Like the safety of others? Are you, uh, are you gonna want me to answer this question? Yes, yes. Sergeant Smith, I'm gonna want you to share your insight on that. Sure. Um, what I'm going to say is that, um, you know, there is specific case law and I and I don't have the specific case laws to um, uh, to give you, you know, um, that because I, uh, you know, I would research it for you. Um, and it would be even better to have um, our city attorney um, and city prosecutors that um, that are the experts in this to give the answer as far as um, that. But um, what this is saying that is if we are, um, if we know that a person has a warrant for an arrest and say it's a domestic violence warrant or a restraining order warrant. So they're wanted on those things. And we know that they live in that house and we see them um, through, like say we see them through the front window but they're refusing to answer the door 
there is case law that would allow us to go into that house to arrest him for that. Now, that being said, um, we do take into consideration the safety of other family members, whether there's children there, et cetera, if we can make those observations. Um, we take that into consideration and make that determination before we take that action. Okay. Does that answer your question? Sorry, this, um, I like your example. It's a very interesting example. Um, I feel like there's something about that that is not quite answered though. So, okay, so, okay, so you can go in. Oh yeah, my question is how much force is being used, I guess. Um, so, so I guess this comes as a case by case on, on a case by case basis. So you are assessing the situation when you are there. Um, how do you, um, how well, your, do you first question, your first question was, what is a warrant? Yeah, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. Like, what does it warrant? What is it, what is it warrant? And how does it, and how much does it warrant? <laughs> well, I mean, there's different types of warrants. There's a, in this case, it's talking about an arrest warrant for a person, mm -hmm. um, for the physical custody of the person and the warrants are issued out of the court. Um, so a state court or municipal court may, um, a judge may issue a warrant for a person's arrest. And in order to get a warrant, you must have probable cause, um, and so um, in these cases, there's, um, there are thousands of warrants that are um, currently um, active. Um, but uh, in this case, it's talking about a very specific incidence where if you know somebody has a warrant, you see them and they go into a home or you see them in the home that you have the ability to go into the home to get him. And you're asking how much force, you know, whether I knock the door down or whether I just open the door and go in, that's going to be totally dependent on the circumstances at the time. Okay. I can tell you that based on my um, experience of 30 years of being a police officer, um, I, I can't think of many times that I did this unless I was actually chasing after the person and they ran into a, a home that I knew what, that was theirs. And so I can't even tell you that um, an example, even recall one that actually, that that did happen. So this is very, very few times that, um, that this actually does happen. Does that make, does that put you more at ease, Bonnie, or did you want more explanation to that? I guess, um, I guess the, the thing that was coming to mind was like a couple of cases that are kind of a blur in my mind, specifically, um, well, I can't be specific. Um, I, I thought there was like this one woman and she was in her house or something. And I guess, that's it. I don't know, I guess I'm just thinking about specific cases where people have been barged in on in their homes and it just becomes violent, but um, I can't give you specifics. So actually I, I will drop it for now. So thank you. And, and, and Commissioner Dominguez, just so we're both on the same page, you know, we'll, you know one of the reasons why I say we talk, I like to, hit some of the things that we talked about before. If, if there's no closure on a certain subject matter and something's gray to you right now, I have no problem with you um, readdressing that, given, given each person, you and others who might know more about it than us, time to kind of, so we're all on the same page. I, I, like, I like for us to know the answers to some of the questions. And you would pose some great questions, but you know, we wanna make sure we're both on the same page as far as what you're asking and what, what he's, she needs to be researched. Commissioner, um, are, are you done with your question? Did you have another one? No, um, I just want to say thank you. That Thanks, yeah, thanks for saying that. Welcome. Commissioner, I'm going to start saying Commissioner Ibrahim. Yeah, Commissioner no Ibrahim. I, I go a lot by first name, so. Okay. <laughs> and I so wanna, I, am I going to make me a little easier? In time, I'll get it. I want to apologize to everybody here if I happen to call you by your first name. I, I, no problem. I, so I, I, my question is, is the warrant give you the permission to enter a specific area to arrest someone or to arrest someone wherever they are? Let's say that I have a warrant a, 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 on me and I happen to be at Councillor Zelenka's house. Uh, do you knock? Do, do, do you have the permission to 
um, go in that house to arrest me or, or how it works. So who's, who's at two? two? Um, Sergeant <laughs> Vinci? Who's that question directed to? Uh, I, I can I can talk to that, but I think uh, Julie's covering that topic right now. Yeah. <laughs> So I, I think that we, I think it's important that we go back to what this paragraph is addressing here. It's telling officers that you cannot chase after and go into just anybody's home to arrest somebody um, unless you know it's their home. Otherwise, you have to go to the court and get a search warrant in order to enter that premises. So I want I guess what what I wanted to go back to is paragraph three that um, that Commissioner Dominguez is referring to is this portion of the policy is telling officers that it, that's very restrictive of when you can do that. And you can only do it if, if, and you know that the person has a warrant and you know, it's their home and you actually see them. Otherwise you have to go to the court and get a search warrant signed by the judge before you can go in to make entry into that premises. So does that kind of help um, clarify what this paragraph is telling officers here? Yeah, and, and uh, Dallas, if I may um, say something, is, um, I mean, I'm going to clarify that with Jeremy. I don't know how to get to the agenda and uh, the, the, the meeting materials, so I don't, have, I don't have it right now on my screen, so I have to go with what I'm hearing here, and that definitely answered my question. Uh, because I didn't know um, um, how what's the procedure of those on, on that one. And, and uh, maybe my last question, do we have in Eugene here the no knock warrant or how I think it's, it's called no knock warrant, right? That's what it's called. And last yes, we no, talked about it, we do not have that. Sorry, I wasn't here last week. Thank you, Sean. And, no, this uh, was a couple of years ago. I think Okay. Uh, everybody <laughs> here missed out on the conversation. So Commissioner Kulabali, I, I do wanna finish answering the question is, is that you asked the question, if you had a warrant for your arrest and you were in Commissioner Zelenka's house, could yeah. I forcibly enter that house and take you into custody? Since that's not your home um, and you do not live there, I would have to go get a warrant in order to enter Mr. Uh, Commissioner Zelenka's house. Does that make sense? Does that does that clarify that better? Yeah, that makes sense. I just saw uh, um, um, Councillor Zelenka saying that that's not your home. He said, yes, that's right. <laughs> I saw you nodding. <laughs> Although you're welcome at any time, Abraham. Well, great. So I'm gonna go on, we're gonna move on. We have, dog. Move on. We have one more question on this and um, that will be Commissioner Wynn. You need to unmute Commissioner Wynn. You're muted. Okay, there you go. Thank you. Thank you. Um, it's not really my question, but Scott Lemons, uh, HRC wrote a question in the chat box. Um, can I read that out? Please, go ahead. Okay. Um, so Scott wrote, what if my hypothetical son looks like me and entry is made on that behalf? Uh, this could be an abuse under officer interpretation and could have severe consequences. That's, that's verbatim. I don't have any um, other ways to <laughs> explain this. Um, it's in the chat, so if anybody wanna see it, it's, it's there. Okay. Okay. That's all. Thank you. Does any does do Sergeant Smith? Is that something that you would like to answer? And if not, we have it on the record, the question, and then we could do further research with an answer. Because I don't want to give back a hypothetical um, answer either. So let's let's move let's move forward to our next um, agenda item is our Pepperball Command Directive Update. Now, Chief Skinner is not here today. Um, he contacted us earlier, he had a family, and he apologized for not being here. Once always enjoys our meetings so forth, we had something that he had to do to miss this. So um, I, I have instructed Jeremy to at least give us um, 
some information on the directive. So we at least know on the pepper ball directive that the chief has put out and the changes that we have. Jeremy, I'll give it to you. Hello. So uh, it is my honor to uh, show you um, specifically what you requested. Um, this was back in October. So I'm gonna go ahead and bring that up because I think that'll help with the command directive. And you'll see that chief went ahead and instituted what um, the police commission had requested to be changed in policy at that time. And so this is just because it was, it was in the, um, it was on your, uh, your 14 points of things to cover was to come back and review, um, well, that policy, but specifically for an update on this. So I'm going to go ahead and bring this up. And I know there's more that we're going to be covering in the future on this on, on the pepperball policy. But this is specifically just to show you. Yes, uh, Bonnie, I know there is. Um, but this is specifically to show you the uh, adjustment and command directive that you recommended. So here you go. So the command directive. Uh, that you see in front of you specifies two different corrections that were made. And the one was here um, in section B4, it's highlighted, inert pepper ball projectiles may be used to disable unaccompanied lights, cameras, and other physical objects as necessary to make scenes safer for officers. For example, cameras attached to the building with barricaded subjects inside and area lights that illuminate officers and officer movements. That was the first change of two. And the second change of two that the police commission had requested that was implemented is uh, here in section D1 when it states when possible. These are minor changes, but it was specified uh, back in the retreat that you guys wanted an update on this. So this is just a little house uh, keeping update for you so we can go ahead and check that box. And uh, I do understand that there will be more questions regarding this policy as we move forward, but um, this is to, to do exactly that, to check that box. So I'm gonna go ahead and close this and um, see if we have any other questions. I realize it was simple, but. No, and we, we, appre we appreciate that. So, yeah. move, so moving along, uh, we're now at the vice chair outreach report. And since, um, you know, Commissioner um, Ibrahim is new to this, and I just want to make sure we're all on the exact same page. Many of us in joining, we represent various factors in the community. And many of us are involved in various parts of the community and various parts of the community come to us often as a person that can share to this commission, what's going on? What are our complaints? What are our issues? How can we be a better bridge for that community? So it's not a requirement, but it's, it's, it's that if you're on the commission, how would you get your intel? I would assume that you're getting your in, intel from your peers. So this is a way for us to say, this is kind of what I've done this past month. And if you haven't, if there's nothing to bring to that report, then there's nothing to bring to that report. And this is not a creating something, it's a sharing something that you might have. So it's a quick or as long as you make it. So I have, so if there's any questions, there shouldn't be any questions because either you did, you're bringing something to the table or you're not bringing something to the table. So I'm gonna leave this in the hands of Commissioner Mogar and we'll go from there. Thank you. Um, so yeah, part of the thing is we we are hoping to build bridges to other parts of the community so that we make sure that when we have a space to fill that we have somebody who's already sort of involved and, and has a background on, on what we do here at the police commission. Uh, the other part is, you know, making sure that the community knows what we're doing here. So in the past, it was uh, something where we had to sign off list and we were looking at different neighborhood, uh, what are they called? Neighborhood? Um, Networks? No, the city has a, an official de designation for- Ward? Uh, Alan knows Maybe what I'm talking about. 
mean neighborhood associations? Associations. 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 Okay. Yeah. So, uh, so we had neighborhood associations and we had different groups that we were reaching out to. Some of the groups didn't want us to be at the table. And I can understand that. And I can understand the hesitancy there. But we're, we're asking basically is if you are a commissioner at this table and you have a community that you serve, if you would um, just take the time to announce that you're a, a part of this commission and that if there's any questions, you'd be willing to answer. If you there's any uh, opportunity for an invitation that you would be willing to inv invite people to come and, and sit on the um, attendance and, and just kind of see what we're doing here. And I will say for me, myself personally, um, uh, LULAC has been um, meeting regularly and we're looking at making some new leadership changes and that uh, I personally will be running for the presidency for LULAC, who I'm currently a vice president. And uh, after that occurs, once COVID is gone, we're gonna have a regional conference here, which is kind of a big deal. So um, they know that I'm here. They know that I've served on the ad hoc committee as well. So uh, I generally give good, good reports about what we have been doing at the police commission. Commissioner Ibrahim. Yes, before I talk about what I have in mind, um, Commissioner Morgan, can you tell us what, what LULAC stands for? What, what's LULAC? Yes, thank you. So LULAC started in 1929. It's the largest Latino-based organization in the nation. It uh, was sort of on the heels of the NAACP came out of a number of different smaller organizations in Texas. Uh, it stands for a League of United Latin American Citizens. There's been some history of, you know, is it an assimilation group or is it a, a group that just supports? Um, we've kind of done, been done with that conversation for a while now. Uh, we're not an assimilation group. Um, LULAC was actually the last major meeting that John F. Kennedy was at. He was at the uh, LULAC National Conference the night before he was killed. LULAC started the Head Start Schools. Um, LULAC was instrumental in Brown versus Board of Education, some uh, case law that took part of uh, in, in California that was helped by uh, LULAC. LULAC is also uh, supported and sort of was foundational in the work of the uh, MALDEF, the Mexican American Legal Defense Fund. Um, and we have not had a LULAC organization in the in Oregon for about 50 years until uh, we started one eight years ago. Okay. Uh, uh, my next clarification question is, is it the moment for a, a board member to make recommendation to this board? As far as what type of recommendation? Well, I, I would like to make the recommendation to this board to um, um, make a recommendation to uh, EPD to have on the back of the police officer's business card it, the number to call EPD and to file a complaint. Because when we ask um, people, you know, you can go to the website, the person have to have access to internet and they, they have to be uh, uh, literate when it's come to internet. And I think that uh, a police officer can hand a business card with the name on it when they uh, interact with someone. And on the back of that business card, you have a contact, I don't know, uh, a phone number that you can call to file a complaint about you know, the interaction you have with this person. And the next level of that would be to probably put it on the back of the patrol car. When you see some business cars where um, you know it says, "How is my driving?" <laughs> you know, <laughs> call this number. I think uh, having those type of uh, uh, that that number on the back of a patrol car 
uh, uh, want to file a complaint against a police officer, call this phone number, and and and, and it, it gives people the opportunity to do so on the fly instead of looking for a place where they can get internet, knowing how internet work, finding the website, and uh, and uh, filing the complaint online, uh, and that will actually bolden and, and build a some sort of, uh, of, of of trust between the community and EPD because they, they they know that if the interaction I had with this person is not uh, doesn't meet what I think should be the standard for uh, uh, a police officer behavior, I have a phone number I can call. And most people have access to uh, phones through library, through uh, uh, um, other places, uh, even borrowing someone else's phone, than having access to internet, going to a website and filing a complaint. You have to know how to read. You have to know how to write. You have to know, a, a, you know, a, a lot of other things. So to kind of alleviate or, or mitigate or get rid of those barriers, uh, I would think that you know having a phone number to call will probably be uh, the best way for people to complain. Not that I want the police officer to be in trouble, but at least for people to have a venue within APD, within the police department, where they can bring their complaint to, where mm -hmm. they can express what, what they have on their chest. So we have a few moments at the end of the meeting where we get to do commissioner comments and that would be a perfect time to have brought this up, but uh, in the future, um, yeah. we could save it till then. Right now, we're just kind of trying to get feedback from any conversations you might have taken place uh, that might have taken place with you in the in the community, and just you know share. Do you have anything that you'd like to share with us about like uh, outreach that you've done into the community? Oh, outreach is I re I reached out to FBI to talk about the color of law. The color of law is. A, a, a USC um, United States Code uh, uh, 18242 that allows um, the, the, the color law violation is uh, any public employee, state, county, uh, or federal, who violate a, another person's civil right on while they are on duty. For the person to file a complaint with FBI, for the FBI to investigate that complaint. So it's, you know, me as a body employee, and if I violate your right, you can file a complaint, or any police officer and any uh, 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 um, library worker who do those kind of things, you can file a complaint. So these are the type of um, uh, uh, conversation I'm personally and through my organization, Human Rights, Human Stories, are trying to promote because more business people have to complain about what they think went wrong uh, uh, with, uh, during the in interaction with the public employee. Better trust or uh, stronger trust will build between the community and, uh, and the agencies. It's always good. Yeah, Thank so, you so, so much. So we'll make sure we're all on the same page. Yeah. Everything you just said is very, very important. But some of that, some of the, what you just finished bringing up is more where I would kind of want, I believe, more your liaison report as far as what, because what you just said is from the human rights side of things, what you're doing. Mm -hmm. And that's what we want to know. During that time where we're talking about liaison report, we kind of want to hit on that. Where we're at right now, and this is your first, so I'm just sharing with you so you know, so you know. Where we're at now is more, more from you're a former president of the NAACP, and you probably have a very strong relationship within the Black community in Eugene, okay, as well as well as I do. So where, where I could see you really bringing something to the table in your side is either through conversations with, the, there's a new president now, as far as having a conversation with him, what is what is he hearing? What's happening? And, and, and that right there, from from this side, as far as the outreach, is kind of what we're thinking is there, because that's because that's where we really need the help. It's because often, folk that look like us feel that 
issues that we have is not being brought to any table. Mm -hmm. So if you're not bringing to the table, and if I ain't bringing to the table, it ain't brought to the table. Unless someone sees exactly what we see or is walking in the exact same shoes that we're walking in. So that's kind of where we're on that outreach part. As far as everyone here, I want y'all to know through my outreach, this past October was through the American Cancer Society. I was one of the 14 community leaders, men chosen to raise money. I want to let y'all know that as I represent the Eugene Police Commission of 14 contestants, I got second place. I apologize for getting second place, but that, that, was, that was the best I could do. I raised $32,000 representing the Eugene Police Commission, and that went a long way. Um, here at the station, we did a, a, a commercial with me and the chief. We had the pink motorcycles. We had, and, and he, let me tell you the impact. The impact was this. Two years ago, we raised the most amount of money, $101,000, record year for Lane County. Now remember, cancer affects everybody. Everybody in this commission knows someone that has been affected by breast cancer. So this money goes to Lane County. We set a goal for $150,000, which is $50,000 more than basically our best year. This campaign, we raised $265,000 for the American Cancer Society of Lane County. So we hit a home run and y'all were a part of it indirectly. When you, when I was asking y'all to share, because we're going to be better next year, when I was asking you to share, I was getting donations from people that you know just by sharing the cause. And sometimes you didn't even know that someone did it. I, I know it. And I was getting donations from people that you know from other states where money was coming in. You don't raise $32,000 by yourself. It's the efforts of all. So these are the type of things, because I always want people to realize that we see what's going on in the community and we want people in the community to know that we hear you and we wanna be a part of the community. We wanna be a part of um, making the Eugene a better place. So thank you from me, but applaud yourself because we stepped up to the plate and as a commission, we raised over $32,000. So that's what we did. Who came in first? Any other commissioners that would like to share some outreach stuff? I know you're working on some stuff, Commissioner um, Dominguez. Do you got to share with us some of your ideas on outreach? Uh, yes. Um, so I was talking um, uh, to Beatrice um, Otero Hernandez, and we were talking about partnering up for more outreach opportunities. And um, so I'm pretty excited about that. I really like tabling. And so she's planning some events for. Um, the CRB and the police auditor. And she said that we can tag along. She might, um, she, I mean, there's a limited amount of panelists for the public safety forum, which is uh, uh, specifically targeted to Spanish speakers. And uh, she might want one of the police commissioners to come aboard and talk about the police commission and answer some questions during the panel session. Um, but also there will be a table for us. Um, and she's thinking that that'll probably be in March if things go well COVID wise. Um, but even then we were discussing about holding events regardless because like, I mean, restaurants are still open and people don't wear masks during those events. I mean, just when they're out and we were thinking about using a school and having one of the, like the larger spaces that are open um, and maybe holding one of the events that she already has um, planned. And then another thing that she was talking about is maybe the possibility of having um, uh, having us talk about or create a script for um, uh, La Equis, which is a radio station, my understanding, um, um, and having us be able to promote what it is that the police commission is. And in addition to that, um, start talking about the next round of, of recruitment for the police commission um, in the Spanish speaking community. So. So that'll be interesting. And she said she'll get back to me on that to see if um, if that's something that they can fit in to their schedule. Uh, and who is that? Would you be willing to be a part of that conversation, Bonnie? Uh, I'm not personally one? bilingual. Which The outreach to the, the public safety uh, side. Yes. Am I the only one that speaks Spanish here? I, I my, my Spanish is muy malo. 
Oh, okay. Yes, I, I speak Spanish. Uh, uh, pretty well. Yeah, I'd say so. Yeah, I could do that. <laughs> um, so yes, I could do that if she wants me to be a panelist, but I really enjoy tabling. So I would probably at very least be doing tabling. Um, and then the other thing that we discussed is she's been having a hard time getting into the churches um, where a lot of the Spanish speakers um, tend to be, in my experience, having been raised here. And, um, and I've been able to get into the churches many times with different groups, and I'm hoping that I could do the same thing with the police commission um, during the social hour, assuming that that's still going on. So I'll have to check. Um, and just about, um, she talked about, oh, she was hoping that um, if anybody else wants to work with her, specifically um, um, with regard to different groups that she doesn't usually reach out to. So she's usually focused on Spanish speakers. So she was wondering if anybody knew how to connect with other groups, um, more diverse groups and just that. And uh, so, yeah, so anyway, partnership with her would be really great. And, and I've been doing a little bit of outreach in the homeless community. Um, and um, uh, there's, that's a hard one. It's, it's still very confusing where homeless people are supposed to go and like the police can't redirect people. And again, it's not the responsibility of the police, but the police are involved and it's just kind of hard um, to know where to direct people. And I guess that just keeps painting us kind of, not us, but like us, like what is it that we're doing and what is it that we are looking at policy-wise? Like I've looked through the entire policy and procedure. And as far as I can tell, we don't actually have anything specific to homeless people and like serving the purpose that the police serve, where it's just like, okay, so these are the resources that are being allotted to these things. And like, okay, so you have like that giant thing that has the camera on top and like all the lights and stuff. We have no policy or procedure that actually regulates these things. And so nobody can reference these things. And it just kind of seems like we're we're missing pages of stuff that need to be addressed. Um, okay. That's what I want. And, I'm, I, and I hear you 100 percent. Pretty sure we do. Have what, I, what, I, what I would like what I would like is um, Councillor Zelenka to kind of add to, to some of your questions that you just had, because as a counselor, he should he should be at least as far as I'm concerned, more on the no. So is your question like, what are we doing with the homeless? Um, it's not about the homeless because that's not our responsibility. It's just what our police do with the homeless. And I haven't seen anything in the police policy or police policy or procedure that actually specifically talks about like, how do you manage a camp? Like, what do you do? Like, none of that stuff is anything that we can touch because there's nothing for us to grab onto and touch. Like whatever the city's doing and like the city people, like the, what are they called? Like the park park the council ambassadors or whatever like i have we have nothing to do with them but we still have police that are out there doing things and yet we have no policy or procedure to help direct the conversation in any kind of way um well specifically to homeless camps and and uh, illegal camping um those are actually done by public works and parks parks and open space folks, they're in charge of that. The police go there and stand to the side to make sure nothing happens that would um, that become, if anybody becomes violent or if there's some other crime that occurred. But those, so their the policy that they have is, is a standby just in case, and it's all run through public works and parks and open space. And as far as those camera towers, the, the guardians, um, they're, I, pretty sure, Jeremy, we have a policy on how those get used. I know we discussed that when we purchased them uh, at city council and, and uh, we're assured uh, the types of uses that they would occur, how long the, the video is kept and things like that. So um, Jeremy, do you have anything to add on that? Yeah, you're correct. The, the police commission was a large, uh, was largely in part of making that policy possible. So yes, that policy very much yeah. does exist. And, I, have, and, I, and, I, and I see your hand up on Commissioner Shipper. So you, you, you are next. But, but that's, that's the, and one of the things I want to make sure is that we have so much talent on this commission. There's so much knowledge on this commission. I want to make sure that when, when we know the answers or at least the best, we have, I'm, I'm keeping an eye on these, the talents that we have here. So thank you, um, Councillor Zelenka. Um, Commissioner Shivers. 
Yeah, I just wanted to say that uh, over the last month or so, month and a week, um, I had folks reach out to me from Heat as well as uh, a couple of local uh, communities of faith uh, with the concerns about um, the camp, what what is going on at the camps as well. So Bonnie, if you want to um, round up, if you have like specific questions, I would love to introduce you to uh, uh, Barbara Date, who is one of the um, community of leaders of faith who has historically been pretty involved in police stuff if if that's of interest to you uh yeah it is um and i guess just to like i guess the concern that i keep hearing from homeless people and like the volunteer groups um or activists is they they keep i think i think it's just the perception or like that trust with the police is that the perception is that the police it because of those guardians, I think it's just like they have this perception that like the police is the one that's managing these things. And so the view is negative and it's just like these are what are they calling them or they're calling them like um internment camps. Or I can't remember what what some negative thing, like some very negative thing where it's just like big brothers watching or whatever. And anyway, um so um so I guess it's just I don't know if there's a better way to really clarify that it's not the police that are or that are making things uncomfortable or like the lights aren't controlled by the police like the fact that they can't sleep right because it's too bright or whatever like it's not the police that's doing that because it's just the idea is there that it's the police that's doing this and it's a police state or whatever it's in this tiny little fenced area and i guess that just doesn't create the perception of the police that i think that Chief Skinner would like, which is just like, we're trying to be better. We're trying not to be involved with um, um, all the negative things that might be perceived that the police could be doing with homeless people. A am I making sense? I'm sorry. Yeah. yeah. No, you, you, you're making sense. You're making sense of a great question. So I have also heard we're, expressed. We're, we're, we're going to be wrapping this up pretty soon, but I'm going to go ahead and do. Uh, I, so can I, then, can I address specifically oh yeah, the concern oh yeah, that Bob oh yeah. cited? Yeah, I've also heard expressed the um, feeling that uh, when enforcement is jumping between agencies, it is uh, it is an attempt to outrun oversight is the um, opinion that I've heard expressed. Uh, and I don't have a great uh, ability to counter that. Uh, you know, we don't have a say in what in what parks is doing and the community as a whole uh, does not really have a say in what parking enforcement is doing at the same level that um, that we do here on the commission. Commissioner Zelenka? Yeah, Councilor Zelenka. I, I understand what you're saying, Bonnie. I've also heard the exact opposite. I knew, and I'm pretty sure we've actually had several people request those guardians towers uh, because they feel safer because they're there because people, somebody's watching it. And, and if something happens to them or tries to attack them, it's on video and the lights go on. And so they, they there actually have been places where we've actually put it at the request of uh, homeless camps and other places because they feel safer with those there because mm -hmm. they actually do do what they're supposed to do. Jeremy, I my know you have time. My comment was just to specify that we need a motion to extend if we're going to continue the meeting. Okay, can we get a motion to extend by two minutes? Two minutes. So I'm going to do a close, closing closing comments. So moved. I, I okay. motion to extend for two minutes. That's it. All right, two minutes. Thank you. Okay, so we're going to go ahead for closing comments. We have to vote on the motion. We have to vote on the motion. Can we vote on a motion? All those in favor say aye. Aye. I have it. Nay. Uh, Commissioner, Commissioner nay. Wynn. <laughs> so I've got two nays. We have two. Dr. Garcia was a nay. And so is so. And so was still... Vice Chair Motor was a nay. But the, right. but the yays outweighed the nays. Nays so outweighed. We'll v we'll for a nay. Two is well, correct. V was a nay as well, correct? No. V is a oh, yes? Yeah. I'm the opposite. I'm, I'm okay with two minutes. Okay. All right. So I got two, two names. Two minutes. Copy. Good. All, All right. right. Thank you. So, Commissioner Wynn, closing comments. Yeah, I, I was listening to the uh, conversation uh, you all were having, and um, I have uh, 
a couple of businesses that I that express concerns for their uh, you know brick and mortar buildings. Um, I met one business owner who um, expressed frustration with um, uh, just rows of you know RV campers parked in front of his you know business. Uh, limiting parking spaces available his, for his service vehicles. Um, plus, he said that um, there were some uh, uh, burglary and you know break-ins and all that were happening um, on that on that strip of, of businesses. Um, so he's not sure if they're you know related to the overnight campers um, uh, or not. And uh, there was a store. Uh, who was, you know, owner was very frustrated with the loitering in her parking lot at night. Um, and, and she just wished that, you know, there would be police cars going by and, uh, you know, just to check on her uh, business to make sure that, you know, no one's trying to break in or anything like that. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Commissioner, Commissioner Shivers, closing comments? Uh, I'll just hold them for next time so we can get through this. Commissioner Dominguez. Um, I thank you again, um, Chair Boggs, for all the, um, I, I just, I think you've been very supportive and you keep reiterating certain things about how our questions are important. And sometimes I really need to hear that. So thank you for doing that. And it was nice seeing everybody. Commissioner, Commissioner Robertson. Commissioner Davis. Hello, um, I don't have any cool closing comments and it was good to see everyone. Thank you. Commissioner Mogar. Uh, welcome, Ibrahim. I look forward to working with you. And uh, it's been a long day for me, so I'm grateful to be getting off. Commissioner Ibrahim, any closing comments? Uh, Thank you for having me. Um, I'm looking forward to be part of this group and uh, uh, to learn from each and all of you. I'm looking forward to uh, bringing whatever skill and experience I have to this um, commission. And uh, thanks for having me. Thank you, thank you. Dr. Dr. Garcia, closing comments? Uh, no comments except welcome, Ibrahim. Councilor Zelenka? Uh, welcome, Ibrahim, to the group and uh, really good dialogue today, good conversation, a lot of interesting stuff said today and helpful stuff, probably more importantly. <laughs> well, folks, I want to I wanna apologize for taking the five minutes or so beyond our normal time. I got us out of here about a half an hour last meeting. So I'm definitely a person that likes to keep it short. We had a lot of stuff that we covered. We had a lot of guests. And uh, thank you very much for your time. I'd like to end this meeting. You're net 25 on us, Dallas. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Have a good Bye, day. Bye, all. Bye, Bye everyone. everyone. Great day. Talk to y'all in December.